Hey, Chelsea, it's Jolene. Um, and we probably want everybody to stay muted um, during the presentations until there's time for comments and questions. Yes, that is a good point. <laughs> I'll go over a couple of the, you know, for people who haven't been doing webinars or aren't, you know, we just a couple of reminders about um, being respectful and kind of preserving the bandwidth here. So I'll just wait a couple minutes and then we'll go over everything. Okay, I know it's just been a couple of minutes. I don't know if I want to know what that photo is on the slideshow. Um, Dave, I don't know if you can explain that. Could it be dye testing? Oh, well, there you go. It's always a simple answer. I guess I'll, yeah, Ghostbusters. Okay, I'm going to turn my camera on briefly. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, um, so we're going to get started just so we don't cut into Doug's time and our presenter's time. Um, welcome and good morning. Welcome to our AZ Water Pretreatment Committee's first, um, well, first official workshop. So we're doing two half days. Um, today is the first day and then tomorrow will be the second day. Um, just a, a couple of logistics that I want to go over with um, quickly. So make sure when you um, join that you mute yourself. Um, if I hear noise from certain people, then I'll go through and mute. Um, also, make sure that you turn off your video unless you're talking or presenting. Um, I'm not sure if it'll slow down the bandwidth, but I have seen that for... <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. I have noticed that for other presentations or like on Zoom or WebEx um, that it'll slow down some of, you know, the connection if everybody has their camera on. So it seems like everybody has their camera off for now. I think most people just do that automatically. Um, also, um, we might have people turn on their camera and their mic, obviously, during the round table later, um, especially if, you know, you want to discuss or have some input. So we'll do that later. Um, please feel free to make use of the chat. I know a lot of us have been chatting in the chat window. Um, that's the most helpful for being able to share information and ask questions. I'll be looking at the questions and um, documenting them so we can ask them later and then you know call on people if they would like to speak. So please use the chat function. Um, and without further ado, um, we will have Doug Kobrick, who is the current president of our AZ Water Board, and um, he's going to do our welcome and kind of go through kind of uh, an AZ Water spiel, if I will. Um, so thank you, Doug, and I will hand that over to you. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you, Chelsea. I'm glad to be here to give you my spiel today. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for, for being at this event. I was scanning the list of registrations uh, a little bit ago, and uh, when I logged on, there were 124 people signed up for this event, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, especially given the challenges we're under right now. I know that this, you know, when this was a live event, 
uh, it was always a big success and it's just great to see that uh, you guys have transitioned to another virtual event and, and been able to get such a great turnout. So we've got people here from uh, Rock Springs, Colorado Springs, Wichita, Albuquerque, Eugene, San Luis Obispo, Hampton Roads, West Charleston, Asheboro, several places in Utah, several places in California. Uh, this isn't an Arizona event, it's a national event. So that's just absolutely terrific. So congratulations uh, to the committee for organizing this and thank you everybody for coming and being here. Uh, the committee's done a great job, obviously, to establish this as a uh, as an event that folks circle on their calendar. Uh, Chelsea, great job leading the committee. Uh, thank you to all the speakers who have taken the time to be here. And we've got to thank Shana Schwartz for her steadfast service as we have made this hopefully temporary transition to doing virtual meetings at AZ Water. Shana has been just a tremendous resource and I know she put a lot of work in to get this ready to go along with the committee and she does that for all of our other 25 or 30 committees so a, a big shout out for Shana as well thank you very much for doing that i just wanted to make a few comments and then i'll, I'll get out of the way uh, you know it, it is difficult to be having these virtual meetings i know that uh, the pre-treatment and fog group has always been one of the most active in AZ Water. I know you're a great bunch of folks. I used to be the liaison to this committee uh, when I was just a regular board member and uh, there was always such great camaraderie and participation and information sharing amongst this group and it's just great to see that you're keeping that flame alive and uh, and keeping going despite all the challenges that we're under uh, right now. Uh, it's a it's a big ask and I'm hoping that we're approaching the end of it. I won't be your president when we get to the end of this uh, this journey through virtual space, uh, but I do think that uh, that day is, is at least somewhere in sight off on the horizon where we can start to go back to more of an in-person type <laughs> environment for AZ Water because obviously uh, you know, job number one for us is is working together to mutually educate each other and work together to, to get everybody better at their jobs and grow their careers. But another big part of AZ Water is just the, the personal relationships, the friendships, the camaraderie, uh, the collegiality of just working together to, you know, we all have the overall mission of serving the people of Arizona in all the different elements of the water uh, space. So uh, it's it's not as great to be unable to meet in person, but you guys are keeping it going. So and that's fantastic. So just just a quick update on a few things going on uh, at AZ Water. Uh, we are a little disconnected, so if you don't mind, I'll just take a couple minutes and then I'll I'll get out of the way. Uh, you know, this is a great event. Obviously, coming up uh, in April, April 6th through 8th is our annual conference, virtual again this year. Uh, unfortunately, but yet uh, it's going to be very Two, good. Amy, three, I know, is on the six, six, is on the nine, uh, five, on the line three, here, and three. she has done a is tremendous job along with her committee. At the tone, please record your message. When you finish recording, <laughs> you may hang up or press Somebody one for more be. options. So anyway. Um, Amy, great job with the committee on putting together a fantastic conference. It'll be virtual again. We'll have live virtual events and then also the pre-recorded content. And another thing that's been added this year is uh, a virtual exhibition with uh, an exhibition hall in a virtual space. So that's a new feature that they've added this year. So make sure you, you don't miss that. That's you know obviously the, the biggest event of the year. Uh, but the other thing I want to just point out is that many of the other committees have also done a good job of staying active. And so we have a number of other events coming up that you should should be aware of and try to participate if you can. You know, now that we're virtual, one benefit is you don't have to drive all over town to attend these things or all over the state. I know we have I should have recognized we have people from all over Arizona also here from you know way up north to from uh, Flagstaff to Nogales and, and out west and, and to the east also. So it's it's great to see everybody here, but at least in the virtual space we can get together without having to drive all over the place. But 
you know, on, on February 25th, there's a luncheon, a uh, virtual luncheon, of course, about odor control in Pima County. There's a collections webinar coming up on the 11th of March, which might be of interest to some of the folks in this group. Uh, there's a stormwater boot camp going on. Uh, the next event is on the 23rd of March. Uh, the Water Distribution Committee has a pumping class on the 24th of March, and there's just a steady stream of events coming along behind those. So it's just great to see that these things are still happening, even though we have to do it virtually. So just in terms of what's going on at, at the association level, you know, our number one goal right now is just to keep going, just to keep doing things, to keep having events, to keep educating ourselves, to keep generating PDHs. And we're doing a pretty good job of that. I think uh, we've gotten better at these virtual events. They're not quite as uh, foreign to most of us, certainly old guys like me as, as they were at the beginning. And so, you know, we've learned some things from from this time and I'm sure going forward we will uh, make better use of the kinds of tools that we've learned how to use here uh, through necessity during this uh, COVID situation. Uh, second thing is just so you know our finances are very solid. Uh, it's been a challenge uh, to make it through this difficult time but AZ Waters finances have stayed pretty, st pretty steady. We haven't uh, we haven't really lost money. We haven't made money, but we're but we're hanging in there. And uh, the the main thing is not we're not out to make a profit, of course, at AZ Water, but we do need to be financially stable so that we can keep doing all the things that we do. And the good news is that we're managing to do that. And uh, you know, obviously, we thank everybody for registering for this event and paying the registration fee. Uh, it's a great value. Uh, we also have to thank our many sponsors who support us, but the bottom line is our finances are still solid. Uh, our memberships have stayed pretty steady, and so and that's great because it's very easy to lose track of folks when we can't meet in person. And then just one other thing I want to remind everybody is that AZ Water has a strategic plan and then a business plan. And so for for this committee, you guys are obviously delivering on on your plan because you're having this event. But everybody should, you know, feel should be aware that we have these plans and there are some specific things we're trying to do to continue to make AZ Water a, a great organization and to make it better. So uh, that that stuff is on our website. And if you, you know, I encourage everybody to look at it and, and be aware of what we're all about and what we're trying to do. Um, the second thing after keeping going is uh, we have a new executive director. She's not that new anymore. She's been with us for going on a year now, Suzanne Dirk and Bighorn. Uh, some of you may not know her yet. It's pretty difficult to meet people right now, uh, but she is the uh, person who has taken the place formally filled by Debbie Muse, who was a fantastic uh, executive manager for us for over 20 years. She retired and we, we recruited Suzanne and Suzanne is off to a great start. And along with Shana is here to help you. So you guys, anybody, any member, any committee, whatever you're trying to do that has to do with AZ Water, just be aware that Shana and Suzanne are here to help you. Uh, so Suzanne has made it, has, like I said, has gotten off to a great start. And so that's a really key thing we have been able to accomplish over the past year. Uh, just some of the initiatives we're working on as a board. Uh, we are trying to improve our outreach to other organizations and even to the uh, the politicos of our state to get AZ Water a little more recognized as uh, an authoritative vo voice regarding water issues in our state. You know, I, I find it frustrating when you see some story on the news and they're talking to all kinds of different folks, a lot of them attorneys or business people or po politicians, and so often they don't talk to those of us who are actually in the business of doing this stuff on an everyday basis. So we're trying to be a little more visible so that folks recognize that AZ Water has information and a contribution to make. And then um, another thing that we're working on is uh, just sort of just trying to tr strengthen our committees. As I mentioned earlier, we have a business plan uh, that okay. we try to execute on. And so we want to continue to do whatever we can to strengthen our committees. And again, Shana and Suzanne are there to oh. do that and help you guys try to pull off whatever it is you dream up that you want to try to do. Uh, the idea is to find a way to make it happen. Uh, we're working on transparency. I think sometimes folks who are members of the association, but not 
all up and involved in all the intimate uh, dealings of the association might wonder about what's going on. So we're trying to make the information about board meetings and our finances and our membership statistics and all that stuff more visible to the members. And that's something that Suzanne has been working on in particular uh, along with me. So that's something that we're working on. And then one other thing I'll just mention is um, we have launched a social justice initiative. We're trying to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in our in our industry, uh, but also, especially uh, from my standpoint, I think something that we can do uh, as an association for the benefit of the communities that we're all here to serve uh, is look for ways to have an impact outside of our own little circle. I mean, AC Water has always done a great job of educating its members, and we work amongst ourselves, and we, we make ourselves better, but We've also got a lot of untapped potential to, to help our communities progress, to help other folks who maybe have been excluded find their way into this, this industry that we all care about and love and do other things. There's a lot of brain power and a lot of energy and a lot of commitment and a lot of goodwill amongst our members. And I believe that's a force that we could, could focus to try to uh, have an impact beyond our own limited circle. So we're working on that. There's a lot of that kind of effort going on nationally, and I can tell you that um, from talking with other local sections and other states, uh, AZ Water is we're we're a little bit ahead of the curve, I think, in some of the things that we're attempting to do. Uh, but we are collaborating with these other states. But they ask us, you know, some of the ideas that we've been trying to pursue. So I'm very encouraged about that. So finally, I just want to say, you know, keep going. You guys have done a great job pulling off this event. And I commend everybody for doing it. It's great to see it. And that's just what we need our whole association to be doing. So congratulations. You've got a great lineup of speakers today and um, have a great, well, two days. So, and just have a great, have a great session. And, and thanks for giving me a few minutes to talk to you. That's all I got, Chelsea. Thank you, Doug. Um, I'm going to let Dave introduce our first speaker today. So Dave, you're on. OK, great. Again, thanks, Doug. We really appreciate you taking the time and uh, sharing your morning with us to give us the updates. Our first speaker today is Spencer Parkinson. He's from South Valley Water Reclamation Facility. He's been in the wastewater business more than 25 years. He began as an op entry level operator worked his way up to a shift supervisor before he changed departments. Once he joined pretreatment, he be began as the pretreatment coordinator and is now currently the director of pretreatment at the South Valley Water Reclamation Facility in West Jordan, Utah. He holds both a grade four wastewater operator cert certification and a grade three collection certification. He was lucky his wife of 30 years and five daughters put up with him while he worked full time and earned an associate's degree in environmental technology, a bachelor's of science in public administration. And most recently, he's got a master's degree in public administration. So he's also the current chairman for the Region 8 Pretreatment Association. So that's how I ended up uh, hooking up with Spencer. So with that, Spencer, we welcome you and look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, perfect. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So as Doug said, um, I want to talk today about medical institution inspections. And that's how he found me was because I am I am a member of Region 8. I'm the chairman there. Um, this is just a recap of what Doug just mentioned. When he told me I had 45 minutes to fill, I figured I better talk a little bit about myself. So the picture on the right is South Valley Water. We sit in West Jordan, um, which is about 20 miles south of Salt Lake City. We're kind of a far reaching suburb and we're kind of a bedroom community. Um, we do have a few SIUs. We have two hospitals, hundreds of dentists, hundreds of medical facilities, um, different things like that. Um, we run a surcharge program here, so we and we work closely with the cities because we are an inter interlocal um, governed business. And so we um, work with three different cities that discharge it to us directly. We you know we have about three hundred eighty-five thousand 
uh, population that we service. We are a 50 million gallon a day treatment plant, but we currently run about 22 to 25 million gallons depending on the day. Um, so the people from Utah know where we're at. Um, and since Doug mentioned it, I am, you know, I mentioned that we found I am currently the chair of Region 8 Pretreatment Association. I've been the chair for about the last six years. Um, we don't do as much as AZ Water. We're not the overall reaching. Mostly ours is just the annual conference for pretreatment. And we're hoping to hold a physical conference in Cheyenne, Wyoming this year um, in the, at the Little America Hotel. So if you want details on that, um, our website is www.r8, the number 8pa.com. If you want to join our email list, um, we do send out emails periodically for to keep people updated. So that's our email as well on the slide. So the EPA drug waste rule just passed in 2019. And what does that mean for us? Doesn't mean really a whole lot. Um, it's more governed by RICRA standards than it is by pretreatment standards, but it still prohibits the sewering of hazardous waste pharmaceuticals. From a standpoint of a pretreatment program, that's more you're going to watch for the hospitals because they're the ones that are actually going to have those hazardous wastes that have, you know, their P listed hazardous wastes and the ones that have, you know, they're containing the real heavy metals. Um, with that, that kind of leads us into this, you know, leads us into the types of medical institutions that we're going to monitor for. So hospitals, right? They've got all sorts of different things that we'll get into in a minute, you know, but you're, you go in there to get, you know, uh, to get you know seen for being sick, surgeries, you know different things like that, radiation treatments, you know chemotherapy. Um, they have all sorts of waste streams, which we'll talk about a little bit here in a bit. You got your pharmacies, which are now required to do take backs. Um, so if you take your medicines back, they're supposed to return them to the manufacturer, and there's different rules and laws that reside with that. You have your dental offices, which is also a new regulation for pretreatment and have to get the one time compliance report and get the um, ensure that they have an amalgam separator installed, which yeah, around here, you know, some of us were a little bit for forward thinking and have been doing that for years. But even when we did that, we went out and we found that Certain dentists had removed them because they clogged. They didn't know how to operate them. Um, others never installed them, even though you'd sent a letter to them to require it. And we found that dentists are, are pretty well a good penny pension group. When you tell them they have to spend $500 to install an uh, amalgam separator, they really get their hackles up at that, um, especially the older ones that have been doing it for years. Got your medical offices, you know, just your doctor's offices, your Instacares, your um, you know any any type of doctor's office for you know and that's not even including like um, dialysis centers and places like that that we need to you know keep an eye on have military clinics um, we have a military base here in utah we have an air force base you know they have all sorts of medical staff on site and they have dental staff other things like that some of us probably never thought about our veterinarians' offices, but like a like a hospital, like a um, like a dentist office, they still do procedures. They still are re removing tissue samples. They're providing medications, different things like that, and they're doing surgeries. Nursing homes and resident care centers. You know they have a lot of different items there as well, and they have a lot of medications on hand. And they're supposed to dis, you know, dispose of those in a proper manner, which we'll get into in a little bit. You have correctional facilities, which like a military installation have many of the same um, internal facilities that as a military installation does because it's kind of a, a sealed community, if you will, and they're not going to allow them necessarily to go out and, and uh, see the doctor every day. And then you have mortuaries. Now, I didn't put a picture of a mortuary up here. Thought about putting a picture of a zombie, but then I thought, nah, that'd be too, that'd be too much too. Um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of uh, tissue samples and different things and blood and everything else that gets drained in the mortuary. So be aware of those as well. And this is an, isn't an all-inclusive list. Um, it is a 
general list. And, and we're going to talk generally about medical inspections, not really in-depth you know, inspections, because RICRA is going to take care of stuff like that. Um, hospitals are covered by a lot of different um, a lot of different regulations. But things to think about. So I did this presentation for Region 8 a few years ago. And this is just a breakdown of how many healthcare establishments that are listed as healthcare establishments. That's not necessarily veterinarian offices or whatnot. These are just for like human um, use facilities. Um, these, this is the number of establishments in the six states that are in Region 8. Now, Colorado is the most populous state in Region 8, so that's why you have the majority of, of facilities there in Utah. You know, you can see it goes from looks from smallest to, to largest here. But that's just the establishments. Then you think about all the people and the healthcare workers, the the CNAs, the nurses, you know, the the cleaning staff, everybody that works at a healthcare facility. And this is where I think the majority of your issues could come from because people are people. People want to do the easiest things. And so um, it's going to be one of those things that the people are the ones that you really have to watch because hospitals are under regulations. They have specific regulations they have to follow for treatment as well as disposal. And so we have to make sure we monitor, you know, not necessarily monitor, but keep an eye out if you're having issues. U.S. hospitals produce 5.9 million ton, tons of waste annually. Now, this was a number from 2016, and here we are in 2021. So with COVID and everything else, you can imagine that this number has gone up because of the amount of disposal, um, disposable goods that they're using, the, the paper gowns, um, you know, more latex gloves, the masks, everything else that they're having to use um, during this COVID era. So it's probably gone up exponentially. But this is just you know, the regulated medical waste is only 10 to 25% of that. Everything else is unregulated medical waste. That could be anything from, you know, your oxygen cylinders to just trash that doesn't, you know, require any um, necessary um, or, you know, weird disposal type things. But the question is, why should we worry about it? Especially as pretreatment, why should we worry about it? Okay. As I said, hospitals are monitored by other agencies. However, the FDA and the EPA have different ideas about drug disposal. Um, the EPA has more worried about hazardous waste, but the FDA, as you'll see in a couple slides, has a different idea. Hospitals are politically driven and financially driven. Um, they, even if they are a nonprofit organization, they can write off most of their um, you know, a good portion of their debt and everything else, they are still financially driven. I had a call, it's probably been six or so years ago. And this gentleman was like, I don't want to tell you who I am. I don't want to tell you where I work. But I want you to know it's not in your service area. I was like, well, that's promising, I think. And he goes, I work for a hospital. He goes, and I'm their environmental health and safety person. And I'm having a real issue with nurses dumping um, medications, un, you know, unused medications down the drain. And I was like, well, what, what were you doing with them? He goes, well, we're supposed to be sticking them in the red containers for the sharps. He goes, but they were starting to wait, you know, they, we got hit because by corporate, because we were spending so much money on our red waste um, disposal because they were filling up so fast because of all the medications going in them. So be aware those are out there. There's people out there doing that because they are financially driven. It may be, you know, because the CEO of the hospital, you know, he saw his profits, you know, his, his bonus going down. I don't know. Um, I sent the gentleman the pharmaceutical regulations that the EPA has on disposal and on like hospital and medical facility um, treatment. And I never heard from him again. I'm hoping that, you know, he took care of the issue. 
Um, but he was, he, you know, he was a he was a forward thinker. He wanted to nip this in the bud, but he needed some backing to do it. But he also didn't want to call the local pretreatment, you know, agency because he didn't want to get the hospital fined either and have a have a sudden inspection. So be aware that hospitals do have hospital tip lines where you can call in and complain about certain things. Pharmacies also have tip lines um, where they can tell you how to dispose of things and different things like that, and where, how you can do drug take backs. So as I said, the EPA and the FDA have different ideas. The EPA is more worried about the hazardous waste, um, but the FDA, which I'm proud of them, they must have heard I was doing this doing this presentation because up until last week, this little uh, diagram on the on the right was not on their website. Um, but even with this one, you know, do people know how to follow the arrows? You know, do they know if it's if it's you know if you have a drug take back you know option readily available do it anymore you can take them back into the pharmacy i know for a lot of people they didn't like here in utah um, we had white containers that were in most pharmacies but they were also in um, police stations and many of the people did not like walking into a police station just to dispose of their uh their medications you know, and, and it's different. You'll you'll have people call you up asking you, can I dispose of medications down the drain? But then I have other people that are so far to the extreme that they're saying, well, I have some old mayonnaise in my mother's kitchen. She just passed away and, I, you know, it was in the fridge for two weeks. Can I dispose of that down the drain? So it's interesting how different people look at it. Um, but the FDA has a flush list. It has 50 items on the flush list, including fentanyl patches which if you don't know about fentanyl, it is a massive um, painkiller. It is a is a drug that um, if you get a little bit on your skin, it can mess you up pretty, pretty severely to the point that um, police officers and firemen now have to really watch for it um, because, you know, drug addicts will, um, will actually cut these up and chew them so they get a, a quicker high. So be aware of that. Um, you know, and these are some of the drugs that can go down the drain that the FDA says is okay to go down the drain. So I've highlighted some of the bigger ones, you know, fentanyl, hydrocodone, methadone, morphine, oxycodone, oxymorphone. Um, all these by FDA standards are okay to go down the drain. But here's the problem. The Ganges River, one of the largest rivers in India, is now they're finding pharmaceuticals polluting the river. Now, here in the United States, like I said, we have a lot of regulation. So hospitals are supposed to be putting it down, but it's not the hospitals per se that I think are causing the biggest issues. It's not the medical facilities at all. It's the fact that our doctors prescribe quite a bit of medication, you know, and they prescribe strong medication. Um, more so than maybe your body can contain like anything else your body your body uses what it can and then it dispels the rest so by dispelling the rest we end up with a lot in our wastewater streams um to the point so here here in utah we have quite a quite a homeless problem right now and um i work closely with the environmental crimes task force here in the, here in the salt lake county where westron resides and we have homeless camps all up and down the Jordan River, which runs from, you know, south to north <clears throat> along the cities that, that uh, you know, right down the middle of the valley where Salt Lake is. And so we get homeless camps along there. Well, part of the Environmental Crimes Task Force duties is to go out and clean up these camps. The health department goes out and cleans up camps of, of homeless people. And there's always jars of urine laying around. And, and you know, you're thinking, why would there be jars of urine? Well, apparently the homeless that are drug that are um, serious drug users will save their urine, and this is gonna be gross, they re-ingest re it so that they can continue getting high from it because that much of the drug actually passes out their body. Well, that goes with any medication that you're given um, to the point that Snyderville Basin, which is up, resides in Park City, um, Utah, which is up the mountains from me, did a study several years back because they, they discharge into smaller um, streams and they wanted to know kind of you know they did a fish study and whatnot 
And just from estrogen, from birth control and different things like that, um, they found that there was so much estrogen getting in the water that they were starting to have fish that were that were starting to grow both male and female um, sex organs. So this is the types of things that we're looking at. And even though we're, I'm talking about um, kind of inspecting medical institutions, this is also a problem because our facilities do not take out really um, very well some of these drugs because they are total chemical drugs. So in May 2012 and June 2012, um, and all of that summer, we had BYU, Brigham Young University, we had some doctorate students that wanted to do a study on, on uh, medications in the wastewater. So we've got three treatment plants shown on this screen. And these are the May results. These are our influent results, and these are in parts per trillion. But South Valley SVWRF, where I work, you can see, you know, apparently in the south end of the Salt Lake Valley, we really like our caffeine. Um, we take a lot of ibuprofen, a lot of naproxen, you know, and then you get into some of the bigger ones. You get into tramadol and the morphine and the cocaine, oxycodone, codeine. Um, there was a lot more analytes that were that were done that we had results from but when i did this i didn't want to put the whole list on i just wanted to focus in on some of the bigger names that people would know now central valley which is in the kind of center of of the salt lake valley kind of had some similar things you know they did they had less caffeine they have more industry where we have more houses um they're also a larger treatment facility they're probably about double the size in, in uh, flow per day that as we are um, but their numbers aren't quite as high in this in this uh, in May's results, and these are just average results. These aren't daily results. These are just average for the month. Um, and then Provo, which is about 50 miles south of me, is a little bit smaller treatment plant, um, but they you know they still kind of show higher because they've got a lot more um, homes and smaller commercial businesses than they do and residents than they do industry. But what's interesting is we have a completely um, at South Valley, we have completely aerobic system. We do not have digesters. We don't have primary clarifiers. And you can see that our numbers of reduction are still quite a bit higher. Um, you know, or well, we're not high, but we're, the numbers going out are still high as compared to Central Valley and Provo, who both have primary clarifiers and both have um, digesters. So because these these pollutants pass through our body, even though we use them to take care of our, you know, take care of our system and everything, we end up with pharmaceuticals in the wastewater. So just, to, you know, June was kind of the same thing. You know, the numbers kind of show, show the same um, concentrations pretty much. But, you know, in June, schools were out too. So kids were home, probably not getting into the Coke machines at school as much. So that's why the caffeine levels went down at uh, South Valley. But Central Valley, all the parents had to go to work after having the kids home from school. So their numbers went up. I'm just kidding. I don't know why they went up. Um, it's just, you know, like anything else, your, your pollutant levels will, will rise and fall. So the World Health Organization categorizes eight types of waste from from health or, you know from health facilities. You have infectious waste, which is anything like COVID-19, Ebola, anything like that that can cause um, infectious disease. You know, and that you know, and the, the waste from that is like it says, it's lab cultures, it's swabs, it's tissues. And you're thinking, why would we get tissue in the in the sewer? But we'll talk about that in a minute. Sharps, which is anything like your needles, your your scalpels, any cutting. Um, you know they have a lot of disposable scalpels, razors when they when they shave you for surgery, different things like that. All going to sharps. Your pathological, which again is more human tissue or fluids. This is maybe where you get it from. You know you think about your mortuaries, you're going to get that human tissue and, and uh, fluids from the from the mortuary. And so even though they died, you know you could have some infectious disease in that body that that passed away. Um, you could have any number of, of uh, pollutants in that body. You got radioactive, which is, you know, from research. It's from, I had to do radioactive uh, treatment when I had cancer. You know, any contaminated glassware. 
Then you have expired lab reagents, just like if you have a laboratory facility, um, you know, film developer, things like that. You have pharmaceuticals, which is the bulk of what we're kind of talking about today because of the pharmaceutical rule. You have gas cylinders, and then you have your general waste. You know, it doesn't have any blood or related bodily fluids on it. It's just your paper, it's your kitchen waste, it's different things like that. So this is a, a, a medical chart that I found that kind of shows you how it should be segregated and what should go into your um, into each container. OK, so they have specific places that this is supposed to go. All right, so your sharps and different things, your needles and whatnot are supposed to go in the, in the red sharps containers that most most facilities have on their walls. Um, biohazard goes in cans. You know, trace chemotherapy stuff, anything that goes with that, you know, because they don't want it getting out that, you know, goes in the yellow can. Um, Rickra goes in the black and pharmaceutical should go in the blue containers. And the blue containers are recent to the hospitals and whatnot. Um, because most hospitals didn't have them up until about three, four years ago. And then you have your radioactive waste, which, you know, has to be shipped off to be disposed of properly there. So let's talk about some waste streams that come from the hospitals. Here in South Valley, we run a surcharge program, so we monitor our hospitals for kitchen waste. OK, that's BOD, TSS, and oil and grease is what we is what we um, charge for in our surcharge program. We do it for all of our restaurants, all of our all of our food service establishments. Um, but if it's an older hospital, many hospitals have gone to more digital. Um, film developing and whatnot, and even your dentist offices. I've gone in some of those where they, the majority of them, of them have gone to uh, digital, uh, lose train of thought, digital um, film, but some older hospitals, you know, they don't want to expend that cost, you know, to have to upgrade and whatnot. So they're still using, using fixer, to, fixer and developer to, to do their, their film development. Um, you've got pharmaceutical waste. You've got radioactive waste. And you're probably thinking, well, the radioactive waste we don't really have to worry about, but I dare say to disagree. Um, we had a few years back, so it's probably been 10 years back or so, um, we take our, um, at the time, we took the bulk of our biosolids to the local landfill. Well, again, the landfill, you have to pass a radioactive, uh, radioactive waste detector, so it, it, it detects radons, and it went off. And we couldn't figure out why. It took pretreatment a couple years, you know, a couple months to figure out why, and, you know, it took a couple days while that biosolids truck returned to the facility and sat here. It took about a week, maybe two weeks for it to kind of ease off the, the radon so they could take it back out. Because um, we immediately thought that the hospital was dumping radioactive waste. Well, what it turns out was it was just that there was a lot of people that we're having radiation treatment for um, for cancer and everything. <clears throat> and again, it passed into their body. Their body dispelled it once it was done with it. And it was just enough that when it got to our biosolids, that it was um, sent, the, the detector out, the landfill was sensitive enough that it picked it up. So be aware of things like that. Um, disposable wipes. Since about 2017, those have seemed to be the bane of existence for most of us. Um, and you know, and you got more with COVID. You got more people using wipes. You know, it, it's hard to find them sometimes. So be aware of that. Your amalgam separators, um, while not always in a hospital, there are some at the primary. You know, like small children's hospitals, because dentists will put children under um, to work on their teeth. So be, be aware that if you have a children's hospital, you may need to have an amalgam separate at the hospital. And then communicable diseases. You know, you need to be thinking we, you know, when Ebola hit the United States a few years back, um, we worked closely with the hospitals to come up with a plan to, um, to take care of any Ebola waste because their big thing was, well, if they go to the restroom and then it's going to pass out of their body and it's going to, you know, we don't know if it's going to live in the toilet or whatnot. And I had to tell them that, um, you know, because they originally came and said, well, we'll pour some ammonia in there and we'll pour some bleach. And I was like, no, do not do that. You don't need to kill anybody in the room. 
you know, because that create that's basically the the ingredients of mustard gas. Um, but we worked it out to where they would where they would put bleach in the toilet, let it sit for 15 minutes before they flushed it. But on the on the other side, you still had laundry services. So if someone lost their bowels while in bed, you would still have to change those sheets. And so they just decided to use a lot of heavy bleach um, to be able to do that. But then your laboratory services as well. Every hospital I know of, the majority of them, um, because I live in a bigger area, so the bigger hospitals here all have laboratory services. Now with the laboratory services, you got to think it doesn't matter whether it's inside a hospital, whether to send it out to a third party lab. You're going to have tissue samples. Those tissue samples should be destroyed as biohazard waste. Um, you're going to have urine samples, which every lab I know dumps that down the, down the drain and you're going to have fecal samples, which hopefully they're throwing out in, in the garbage, but maybe not. Um, because we have, you know, and then you gonna have all sorts of different other, other samples as well. Blood samples and everything else. Um, we have had a hospital that called up and wanted to put a grinder on their sink in their lab because the, the drain kept getting clogged. Well, it turns out that they were just trying to shove everything down the drain, no matter how big, and just was hoping that water would, would flush it down the drain. And that wasn't always happening. So they wanted to put a grinder on there. My concern was, well, if there's a grinder on there, you're going to dump tissue samples and everything else in there, small bones, whatever else, rather than disposing of them in the biohazard. So we we refused that. <coughs> and we moved on. So with your dental offices, everybody's seen amalgam. Some of us older folks probably have some in our mouth still because they were good for 20 years or better. So now everybody has to have an amalgam separator. Things to watch for when you're with when you're doing your amalgam separator. Is there anything being collected in the trap on the amalgam separator? Because if not, you need to check their their disposal manifest. You know, are they disposing of this properly? Because if there if there's no disposal manifest and there's nothing in the trap, then you need to go see if it's if they piped it to bypass around it and right to the drain, or if it's even connected properly. So that it's sucking in there and through the amalgam separator. Um, and you'll find that, especially with older dentists, many dentists have gone to amalgam capsules, but I've I've talked to older dentists that are like, well, what am I supposed to do with this jar of amalgam now? And they have bulk amalgam, you know, and they spend a lot of money for it. And heaven forbid if you tell them to, to you know, they probably should dispose of it because they're still going to use it. Um, you know, make sure they're putting their putting their um, larger material, you know, their scrap amalgam, their amalgam capsules, their disposable traps, all of that into, you know, like this DR, DRNA trap, which says a, a sealed container. You put the lid on, it has a gasket on it, it seals. You can ship it back to um, whomever you got it from and they will recycle it for them. So veterinary clinics also perform surgeries. You need to be aware of that because they're going to have blood samples. They're going to have all these other different things that they're that they're dealing with, which are in some instances on a larger scale. I'm a rather large dude, but I am not as big as a horse or a cow that's getting surgery, you know, so I'm not going to take as much medication and different things as, as they are. But gloves and wipes are still used. Um, they still prescribe and use medications, especially for um, knocking an animal out to do surgery on it, you know, and they, they'll still need prescription drug disposal methods. Doctor's offices are kind of a unique thing as well, because you're thinking, well, the doctors, you know, they just freeze off some moles or they, you know, take some blood and send it out to the lab, but they still have a lot of pharmaceutical waste because they're medications. They get samples from the manufacturer, from uh, those um, drug salesmen, those pharmaceutical salesmen and women, I should say, um, they they get those and when they expire, what are they supposed to do with them? So this picture is actually from my doctor's office who's in my service area and they just have a biohazard can and then they take this and once it's filled, they dump their sharps in there, they dump their pharmaceutical waste in there and then it goes to a um, incinerator and gets taken care of that way. But they also, like I said, they have sharps, they have needles, they have razors, they have disposable gloves, they have cleaning wipes. 
you know, plus everything else that goes along with it, you know, all the papers and different things like that. Nursing homes are a unique creature because you have a small community that is living together. Um, you have multiple, multiple residents. You have home health nurses coming in there, taking care of wounds, um, taking care of uh, providing medications for these people. And it doesn't care what type of facility it is, whether it's a level one, two or three, you know, an independent living, um, you'll still have nurse, nursing staff going in, you'll still have nursing staff passing you on and uh, um, your CNAs and passing out medications, different things like that. They do have some unique things um, because they do have kitchens at most of them because they're a seal, you know, they're not necessarily a sealed community, but they're a smaller community. They're paying, paying a good price to eat there and do different things. Um, the pharmaceuticals, when, when a resident passes away, those pharmaceuticals have to be disposed of. And it is, this, it is the personnel's responsibility to dispose of those pharmaceuticals. It's not up to the family, it's up to the, uh, because the, the nursing staff and the medical staff at the facility actually um, retain the medications, even though it's for that individual. Um, they're in charge of them. They're not allowed to leave them in the in the uh, residents room. And so the the medical staff take care of providing them with their medications. Sometimes you'll have IV medications. That's more in a skilled nursing facility where it's kind of a step down ICU. Um, the patient is well enough to leave the hospital, but not quite well enough to go home um, because maybe they've broken a hip or they've um, had so, had a stroke or something else and so they have to have some therapy they have to have some medical treatment still and so they might still be on ivs for pain and different things like that but they also have disposable gloves like every other medical field they have but one of the things here too is you have adult wet wipes for many for many uh, residents that are incontinent and they need help uh cleaning themselves and they're in adult um adult diapers so rather than just the wet wipes that are used for children you know which are six by four or so these are about 12 by 12 inches long you know in in um, size and they can really clog up a um, lift station because we had a lift station from one of our entities that was getting clogged and i had to go have a conversation with one of the nursing homes but they've also got the cleaning and disinfecting wipes and it's it's a little uh, and you know it's a little different here too because you're going to have more toilet blockages and different things because even though people are incontinent, they still are human beings, they're still adults, they still feel shame. And so we've had instances where um, the adults will um, flush their adult diapers and, you know, so nobody knows and and try to clean themselves up and, no, you know, so nobody, nobody sees it. And, um, and that causes issues in the pipes as well. You know, and you're going to have biohazards from wound care from those, um, from the nursing staff, the home health that comes in, the hospice that comes in, different things like that. Now, the one thing that's a little bit different with nursing homes and assisted livings is that they have to send out if they if they get a medicine in that the family goes takes takes mom or dad to the to the doctor, the doctor prescribes them a medication. They have to take that medication that comes in a bottle and they have to have it professionally packed, just like these skittles here. My wife is an RN, and so I was, you know, she got this as a prank, and I thought this was great, and so I keep it on my desk actually, um, just to, just as kind of a gag gift and, a, and a, a conversation starter. But they have to package the medications like this, so that they can keep track of the medications that are given, and so that they they have to send it out to the pharmacy and have it packed because the nursing staff is in charge. That way, you don't have a pill come up missing. Um, between shifts or whatnot and the bottle goes empty you know a couple days before it should this way they can keep track of all the pills for the for the resident as well as for the nursing staff now with assisted livings they have to send back their um their their oxycontin their their um you know their higher med higher level medications or they have to use drug buster which is just a, con a container that you drop the pills into and it just makes a, 
it's kind of like rubbing them in a dirty diaper, if you will. Um, it absorbs into the pill. It, it's gotten the liquid in there, and then it just becomes hard, and you can throw the thing away. It becomes inert. Or with like your Oxycontin and Oxymorphone, different things like that, they have to package it up in an envelope, and they have to ship it back to the pharmacy um, or to a disposal site. Now, when they do this, they have to have two people there to do it. They have to have both people sign off that it was packaged and labeled properly, and both those people have to take it to the disposal facility so that no drugs go missing. So while hospitals are a little different and they're a little bit um, unique, VA hospitals, because they are federally owned, are a different creature altogether. Um, We've had individuals at the VA that say, we don't have to listen to you. We're owned by the federal government. We don't have to follow whatever you say and do this, that, and the other. We don't even have to let you in. But the Clean Water Act in Section 1323, which is the Federal Facilities Pollution Control Section, talks about federal government and federal facilities. And it says specifically that um, these facilities shall be subject to and comply with all federal, state, interstate, and local requirements. Okay, so you, as long as they discharge your POTW, you have the right and authority to tell them that they, you know, that they need to look at you. Now, you're going to have a lot of pushback. You're going to have a lot of pushback just from the hospital. With one of the hospitals we have here locally, my predecessor fought with them and fought with them, and it came down to them threatening legal action, and they still put in a sampling manhole, which we can go out and sample, but we don't necessarily permit them for the pharmaceuticals going down the drain, if any. We occasionally go out, we'll pull a sample just to see if there's anything we should be concerned about, um, but for the majority of the time, we just take care of the kitchen, you know, monitor the kitchen, and let the other um, regulatory agencies take care of them. But you do have the authority to, as long as you have it in your city ordinance, or if you're if you're a um, local government, if you have it in your rules and regs, to do this by the Clean Water Act standard, it says that they're required to do it. Um, and if you think you can't, and I shouldn't say this on open line, but we have the NSA here. We have the the Utah, um, what was it? the Utah Data Center. They came in. And we had a meeting with them with one with one of the collection systems that they were discharging to, and we were um, arguing back and forth. And their local person here, their local contractor, was just like, "You don't have any rights. This project's already approved. You're not going to be able to, um, you know, see the plans. You're not going to be able to do this, that, or the other." And we told them, "We says, well, fine. Then you don't have the right to connect to the sewer system." which after my board member got done swallowing his tongue because he was not expecting me to say that and he'd already um, accepted their check for their impact fees. You know, we came to an agreement. I says, we'll stop calling an approval letter. Let's call it a requirement letter. These are the requirements we have for you to tie to the sewer. Well, it took a little back and forth and it took about three months. But when I sent them this specific um, regulation in a letter, back to Maryland to, to head NSA headquarters. About two months later, I got a call and says, what do you need to see? So we got what we needed in the way of compliance because it is a federal mandated um, rule. So be aware that even if it's a military installation, if it's a, if it's a military contractor, as long as they're tied to your POTW, then they have to follow your local standards. Okay, they have other standards they have to follow. If, if they discharge, if they have their own treatment plant, like Camp Pendleton does in California, um, I know that because I was a Marine stationed there many years ago. Um, they have their own NPDS permit, and they have their own requirements and different things like that, and their, pre their um, POTW has to take care of all that. But if it's like Hill Air Force Base here in Layton, we have the right, and the, and the treatment plant that monitors them has the right to go in there and look at their different, you know, look at their different things. Because Marine Corps bases have dentists, they have uh, medical facilities, they have hospitals, they have all of this stuff. So know your authority. Corrections facilities have many of the same things. They've got kitchens because it's a closed community. They're feeding however many, however many, we'll call them residents, um, that they have. 
they also have medical clinics. They're not necessarily going to do surgery at the correctional facility, but they still have doctor's offices. They still have dental clinics. So you need to make sure the dental offices in their in your correctional facilities have um, have amalgam separators. And that goes for federal correction facilities too, because you could have some issues that way, you know, because they're really going to push back. But I tell you, if you you know go in and and uh, inside the correctional facility and doing an inspection, it's a little unnerving when those when those uh, gates clank behind you, you know, and you you know you're sealed in, you know. But they also have a lot of different things. The local one we have here in Utah um, has a dairy farm that they actually produce milk at, and they they fill bags that they um, because they don't let them have cartons or anything, so they fill bags with juice and milk and everything. And and sometimes you know the residents decide that they don't want to deal with the bags, and so they dump them down the sewer. You know, which at the time their common uter was um, down, and so it bypassed and came right to the treatment plant and caused some issues. That wasn't medical waste, but you know you still see at the headworks you see a lot of needles, hypodermic needles. You see a lot of um wipes you see a lot of different things you know gloves uh all sorts of things now mortuaries they're a little bit different creature because you're draining fluids here okay you're taking out the blood you're pumping in um, you're taking out the stomach contents you're taking tissue samples if needed for if they're doing a um an autopsy but they're pumping, you know, they're draining the blood out and it's going down the drain. They're washing the body and then they are filling it with um, the fluid that they fill it with, which I draw a blank on now. But be aware of that. Um, so it's just some problem indicators. If you have wipes or gloves downstream of medical facilities, you probably know where they're coming from, right? Um, if you've got large grease deposits downstream of those same facilities, they probably need their interceptor cleaned out, or they need some, you know, some best management practices installed or put in place. You know, if you have radioactivity in your sludge, you need to look at the hospitals. They won't like it. They'll claim that they're doing everything right, but people have a tendency to take shortcuts. You know, and so they might dump something that they're not supposed to dump. Watch for heavy metals in your sludge. You know, if you're watching your sludge on a regular basis and all of a sudden you have a high spike in heavy metals, keep an eye on that. You can also test for pharmaceuticals in your waste stream, influent and effluent, just to see what your plant does. It is costly, but you kind of need a baseline too to know where to start um, and know what to look for. And always, Look for areas of non-compliance. Now this, this pipe right here was not in the hospital, but it is one that always reminds me, and I like to use it because it reminds me to tell people to open every door and look behind every door. Now in a hospital, that could turn out bad because you know you might open up on somebody doing a, a procedure or something. Um, but this was actually a business that was re, uh, rejuvenating um, feeds for water softeners and so they were taking water softeners and they were un, you know taking the beads out of them and then they put the beads on a, on a bench and they would run acid all over them and they'd wipe them you know just roll them around in the acid and then once they were clean they would wash them off well my predecessor went out and they were you know because we do a lot of business license inspections that's where we end up going into medical offices and the dental offices we get the business licenses from the city and so we go out and we give our approval before they get a business license issued. Well, he'd gone out on one of these <clears throat> and was walking around and they were like, yeah, this is what we do. And he's like, well, where's this pipe drain? Oh, it just goes into the wall. It, it just does this, it just does that. But he couldn't tell. And as he's walking, he walked past the women's restroom, which had an out of order sign. Well, he was kind of curious because they had a lady up front who was running their front desk. And he walked up and he asked her, he goes, where do you use the restroom at if the women's is out of order? And she goes, well, I just use the men's because they had men's and the women's. Well, he walked back and he opened the door and, and the owner was like, oh, whoa, 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 wait. Well, this was what we found. So always look for areas of non-compliance. You know, look for manifests, ask them where they're disposing of things. You know, ask them when the last time they had their, you know, their trap pump, just like we do with any other industry. 
you know, ask those pertinent questions. But also look for opportunities to perform public outreach. I've had the opportunity to meet with um, the National Guard here who has a military base at the south end of the valley um, and, and discuss items like this with them all the way from the lowly private all the way up to three and four star generals and tell them flat out that, you know, if I find you doing stuff negligently or, you know, on purpose, you could be fined personally. Um, but explain to them why you do what you do. You know, give them that opportunity to kind of know what, what you're doing um, so that they can figure, you know, um, kind of go along with that and see what, see what, how they can make adjustments on their end. Um, try to be non-adversarial, especially with the hospitals. They're already regulated so heavily that they feel they don't need one more regulation on them. Um, but if you, if you work with them, you can create that relationship that they will, you know, reach out to you rather than you having to reach out to them, just like the hospitals did for me, um, being able to reach out to me and say, hey, we're worried about Ebola. Um, if it becomes a thing here, how, how, you know, what are your suggestions um, on how to take care of this before we discharge it to the sewage treatment plant? You know, provide all educational opportunities to all users, you know, whether it's a doctor's office, whether it's a dental office, whether it's, you know, an Instacare, a hospital, any other industrial user you have, you know, provide them that opportunity to um, receive some education. So just some quick takeaways. Kurt McCormick, which some of you may know, he's been around for a long time. Um, he says in, in your specific prohibitions in your ordinance, make sure you add um, bulk, expired, outdated, or concentrated prescription or non-prescription drugs. So that if you ever get a spike in there, whether it's from somebody flushing, um, their drugs or it's the hospital or whatever else he was he was promoting this long before we had the um, the EPA ruling about discharging prescription drugs down hazardous prescription drugs down the drain watch for your problem indicators at the plant like I said if you get radioactivity in your sludge if you get um, you know even if just your bugs die off suddenly different things like that watch you know your um, pass through interference things you know all those indicators Know your local and federal regulations so that you can enforce on these people if you have to. But also, you know, you might want to just do a quick inspection to say, hey, we're just here to make sure everything's going kosher, that you're just, you know, disposing of things properly so that we don't have any issues down at the plant. You know, you've heard it, and I'm sure many people have heard of different facilities. We had um, one here locally that was forced before the dental amalgam rule came out that the state authorities forced them to implement an amalgam rule. Um, and force all their dentists to go um, install amalgam separators long before before the dental rule came out because of the fact that they were having high mercury limits in their effluent, in their influent and their effluent. <clears throat> because you know your sludge is only going to take out so much. Once they did that, their their mercury numbers dropped. You know, and be aware that all federal, state, and local facilities fall under your oversight as long as they discharge your POTW. If they're a direct discharger. To a body of water then that's on your state or federal authorities that's not on you any questions um yes. i'll kind of facilitate the questions but it looks like aaron has his uh, hand up oh i guess rick your your um camera's on so you can go first <laughs> No, I just I just joined. I don't have any questions. OK, um, Aaron, did you have a question? Uh, yes, yeah, Spencer, can you go back one slide? Uh, let me get back to it because I just got off of it. Let's see here. That slide or the next one? Uh, one more. Um, yes, so with that uh, local facilities, um, let me ask you a question. Do you regulate any of your internal um, cities water systems that have RO and discharge brine? Um, actually, I do. Yes. So we How? have a water treatment facility just that's less than a mile down the street from me, um, and we, they have an RO system. And the reason for that they have the RO system is because our local mine here um, polluted the water table years ago, and so they are using the RO system to clean the water table. 
Um, but we're lucky enough here that we have, so they had to put a discharge line all the way out to the Great Salt Lake, which is a brine filled lake. It's a dead lake for the most part. And so they discharge all their brine out there. Um, but we do monitor them for all their chemicals and different things like that, the discharge when they do their backwash. Okay, awesome, thank you. You bet. Um, let's see, I think we had a couple other questions, which some of them we could bring up during the round table, but um, I know Ben, Benjamin Zimmerman, I think, had a couple of questions about like the surcharges um, and possibly regulating mortuaries. Okay, um, I don't regulate the mortuaries currently because they're kind of an unnecessary evil or unnecessary evil, not unnecessary, but they're a necessary evil. Um, you know, because where else are they going to discharge, you know, everything? I mean, it's already so, so expensive to, um, to bury a loved one. Um, you know, my son-in-law died a few years ago and it cost us over $20,000 to, to take care of his burial. So I don't want to put that burden on them. Um, and the amount of blood that come that they discharge out of a body, you know, in the total of 22 million gallons, I mean, we don't even see it. And most of us BOD anyway. Now, if it's a slaughterhouse, we do, you know, we have slaughterhouses here. Um, they are regulated um, because of their volume of water, you know, and the volume and, no, and those, you know, the slaughterhouses, they, they, uh, they will slaughter, slaughter an animal and then they'll drain the blood and then that blood has to be hauled off somewhere else. And as the surcharge program, um, if you want to contact me directly, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, we started this years ago. Um, our program has been around about 35 years as so we've done it the majority of that time. Um, we, you know, we sample all of our food service establishments twice a year and we um, build them for anything over. So we allow, you know, we allow a, a household um, strength waste for BOD and oil and grease and for TSS and anything over and above that we charge back to the restaurant um, and it nets us a few hundred thousand dollars a year um to be able to help cover our program costs thanks spencer um i don't know if anybody has more questions about like nursing homes or independent living i made a note that um like there are some risks that might be more well I'm trying to think um like I know in city of Phoenix, we look at apartment complexes a little more closely right now, just because of all the SSOs that have been generated. But I wonder if with the nursing homes, because it's kind of similar, but they also have the added, you know, medical risks, if um, anybody, or if you have any suggestions about regulating that, like if you would regulate that under kind of the FOG program or. So we regulate ours under FOG program. Um, but if you want to know what's going on in a nursing home or a hospital or anything like that, talk to the cleaning staff. Um, because nobody really pays attention to them, so they see a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, the, the, the cleaning staff, the, the janitorial staff are by far the biggest um, boon for me because I'll go in and I'll say, so how are things going here? You know, they'll tell you about all the clogged toilets because people have um, flushed their um, you know, flush their adult diapers. They'll tell you about them because people have um, flushed their wipes. Um, right now, one of the biggest things I have an issue with is, is where our facility sits, we're surrounded. The far side across the river used to be just an old steel mill. Well, now that's all apartment buildings. So we've got thousands of apartment buildings over there and they can they um, have a lot of younger families in which think that any wipe is flushable, whether it says flushable or not. And so I've had a couple lift stations that have been clogged by um, just flushable wipes because, you know, it just they clean. You know, it starts with the cleaners because they come in, they clean the apartments before they rent them out again. They clean them when they're brand new. And so that's been my biggest issue from apartment buildings. But with um, a lot of times with the assisted living facilities, you have more internal flooding because the adult um, diapers don't go down real well um, and the adult wipes are so much larger that they clog the toilets faster than than the traditional flushable wipes. Very good points. Um, 
Well, if anybody has any more questions, um, feel free to use the chat box. Um, we're going to take a, a 15 minute break, just stretch your legs. We have kind of a long stretch after this break, but feel free if you need to leave to you know, go to the bathroom or get more coffee or whatever. Um, you know, we'll be rolling, you know, for a while. So we're going to take a break until 930 and then rejoin and then we're going to welcome Rick. Um, but thank you so much, Spencer. This is a very good presentation, a lot of good topics, um, a lot of good hey, things to bring up. Yeah, there was a there's a question in the chat from Jason Grodman about uh, he wanted to know if you do on do you permit the largest hospitals as SIUs? Do you conduct the compliance monitoring for local limits? We do conduct compliance monitoring for local limits, but we do not permit them as SIUs because the majority of the waste that comes out of there is not industrial waste. Um, so we've never um, thought that they were should be considered an SIU. Um, and so because it, because it is mo mostly um, residential type waste, um, but we do monitor them occasionally for local limits just because there are uh, medications that have heavy metals and stuff in them. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you. Perfect. Um, OK, we will go on break and then. Um, yeah, any more questions that we can always discuss during the roundtable. See everybody in. What about 13 more minutes?
Okay, everybody, we have a couple more minutes till our break is over, and then we're going to have a new speaker, Rick. Um, so if he wants, he can pull up his presentation. Yeah, let me just make sure it looks good on my end. I think we're Can you see the presentation? No. Nope. Not yet. No. I don't know what the deal with that is. Let's see. Do you have to go to share screen or something? Share content. Okay. There we go. You got it? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Cool. It's okay. a good thing I have an IT an IT person here to help me because we'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Okay, I'm going to introduce you first. Um, so welcome back from break, everyone. I'm sure we'll have a couple stragglers, but we'll get started because um, we don't want to miss any of Rick's uh, top presentation today. So Rick Allen has been involved in the environmental business for over 25 years. He's a published author of Critical Issues for Water and Wastewater Professionals. Um, Mr. Allen provides his experience and knowledge to groups and organizations around the country on environmental issues that are grounded in current methodologies and address important solutions to difficult business and operational issues. Um, he provides consulting on a variety of topics, including probiotic solutions and microbiological solutions for water and wastewater treatment. As a CEO of BioLensis, he is invested in helping local communities find natural wastewater solutions for managing treatment of water and wastewater. So welcome, Rick, and thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that last presentation was very good. I learned a lot of stuff that I didn't know before, so that's great. Um, and this, I mean, when talking about the changing world of pretreatment is just because there's so much happening in the world of wastewater today. Um, some of that being driven by COVID, which we, which was alluded to a little bit in the last presentation, but, and, and I don't have any way to figure out how to set up some kind of a pretreatment program on people with flush and sanitary wipes. The best thing to control sanitary wipes, I think is public education, but we I'll get into that a little bit more here in, in a couple of minutes, but, the changing world of pretreatment is just one of those things that we've noticed. Uh, I noticed a couple of years ago, and then I think I even taught this class for you a couple of years ago. But um, the thing that is happening, especially like in Arizona, I'm going to talk a little bit about Arizona for uh, in this presentation because Arizona just um, um, voted in the use of recreational marijuana and THC. So that's going to have a significant impact on your pretreatment programs in the cities in Arizona for sure. California is already working on things to help their systems, but we'll get into some things that California is doing and also talk about some of the other things that are happening out there in the world today. So in the world of pretreatment, one of the things that this is one that came to me uh, a couple of years ago, and that's goat yoga. I don't know if anybody has any goat yoga studios in your particular municipality. Now, does goat yoga fall under your pretreatment ordinance? Yeah, probably not. But this is Denver Coliseum right here. And this is a goat yoga program that was going on at Denver Coliseum a couple of years ago. 
And and I was looking at this and thinking, wow, they got all these people in this room, and they got all these goats in this room. What are we going to do with all of the the uh, fecal matter and urine from the goats? But I understand they actually put diapers on them or something to keep that from happening. But it was just a tongue in cheek kind of thing for me. Something you want to start paying attention to, especially now that you have um, voted in the use of recreational marijuana in your state, in Arizona for sure. I don't think Utah has yet, but um, so goat yoga is something that is going on. Ganja yoga is a California thing right now. Um, ganja yoga, some of you probably already know what that's uh, referring to, but uh, basically it's a form of ganja yoga. As you can, this frog's already participating in it. And the the thing that really amazes me is, is you're taking, you're, you're doing yoga so you can learn to relax and get in better shape. And then they also get stoned before they do it. So it's kind of a ganja yoga thing is like, we're going to take, we're going to smoke some marijuana, then we're going to go to yoga. So kind of a oxymoron for me anyway. And then this bunny's just getting ready to go do ganja yoga. So. Ganja yoga, is it an issue? Yes, it is. And it really just depends on whether, I don't know if, if ganja is the, is the issue, but the production of recreational marijuana in, um, in different cities, different states across the country, depends on whether they're doing a, I'm going to make some, some uh, THC in, uh, in my home kitchen, or am I going to do it as an industrial? And when it gets into industrial is when the pre-treatment people need to stay on top of what's going on industrial, who's making it, where are they making it, how are they doing it, what are the residuals of all of that stuff that they're making. And it's going to be hard for you to maybe even find some of these places uh, to figure out who's doing what, where, when, and how. Uh, it was interesting you know, when listening to the last presentation about some of the stuff that's going on in hospitals and nursing homes that you wouldn't even think about it, uh, but the speaker was very good at talking about those. So you want to make sure that you're doing a, a, a sur survey. And one of the things that I'm going to tell you is if you're not already doing it, every municipality needs to be doing a pretreatment survey uh, of every business in your community. And the reason I want you to do a pretreatment survey of every business in your community is because you don't know when that business is going to change. You don't know what it's going to change to or when it's going to change or how. I was um, headed to teach a class up in Washington State uh, about a year ago and I was driving through a town there that as I was driving through town, I was like, wow, there's like five different dispensaries for uh, CBD oil and THC. And, so, and it was like, wow. So I was like every abandoned gas station had a had been converted into a dispensary for medical marijuana and for recreational miracle marijuana and then CBD oil on top of that. So when I was teaching the class in in uh, Bremerton, I was mentioned this particular town and I said, you know, I'm driving through this town and they had five dispensaries in town and one of the guys that was in the class and he said, yeah, and you didn't even see half of them. What you saw were the ones that were on the main drag when you drove through town. Uh, but there's at least that many more, if many and maybe more, that are spread throughout the community in different uh, housing divisions, subdivisions. So it's become quite prevalent in Washington State. Of course, Washington is one that has had uh, approval for recreational marijuana for a while. Um, and so with Arizona now picking that up, you guys are going to have to be on top of some things that are going to be possibly happening in your uh, community. Yeah, they going to cover some um, program definitions, of course, program considerations, um, benefits and costs, what changes are headed your way. And that is the big one. What changes are head headed your way, especially in Arizona? You're going to see a lot of things happening that you may not be prepared for prepared for, but maybe you are. Um, of course, what is pretreatment? We all know what that is. Pretreatment is basically trying to control what's going in the pipe that's headed to the POTW. And if you're doing a pretreatment survey of every business in town on an annual basis, you will 
be able to mitigate a lot of that. Um, not necessarily all of it, but a lot of it you will be able to. Um, when you write your pretreatment ordinance, I always tell everybody to aim high. Don't try to um, put in there a list of the things that they can't put down the pipe because uh, you know, there are certain things that they can't, but try to be more general if you can in, in your uh, pretreatment ordinance so that you can pick up stuff that you're not expecting to show up in the next year or next two years. Your pretreatment ordinance should be something that you review annually. In my opinion, it should be done annually. Um, at least every two years, you need to go back and you need to look at it and you need to revise it and do whatever you need to to um, be on top of the current and issues that are showing up. And just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we're seeing out there in the world today, Ganja Yoga is one of them that's showing up in California. It's becoming quite prevalent there. Um, I was teaching at Region 8, or not Region 8, I was uh, teaching at Tri-State uh, last year before last, and the lady that was uh, behind me teaching her, she was from California, and she was the one that was telling me about all of the ganja yoga places that are showing up and how her daughter was trying to get her to go do ganja yoga in Sacramento or wherever it was that she was from. And I was like, wow, it's becoming quite prevalent. Colorado, one of the things that we have, of course, is cottage industries. Uh, food trucks now in Colorado can offer um, you a sandwich. You know, you can have a pulled pork sandwich in Colorado now, and they'll add THC or CBD oil to it. All you have to do is ask them. And it's like, okay, so this is getting become more and more a entity or a, a challenge for those of you that are in the voice water industry. In most places, most states, most cities do not have any way to control what we call cottage industries. Those are the people that have the burrito truck that they're filling up with burritos that they make in their kitchen at home. The downside of those industry, those particular um, uh, businesses is, is a lot of them will cause issues within your collection system if you're not careful and if you don't try to get some kind of control on them. Have a, a system up in Oregon that had a lift station that just was full of grease continually. And we tr tried everything we could to get the grease out of there. And, and, I, and I kept asking the, op the uh, operator, said, why are you getting all this grease? And he's like, I don't know. And it was just a little subdivision in the middle of a small community in, in Oregon. And then a couple, about a year later, we were talking and he says, well, what we found out is, is that there are half a dozen food trucks that prepare all of their food in this community every night. So he had six burrito trucks in this little tiny community and all of them were discharging to his lift station that was getting impacted with grease uh, that was, was causing uh, sewer system slowdowns, overflows, all kinds of different issues with his. So I don't know how you're going to get on top of uh, the cottage industries, but it's something that your community should look at and see if there's something that can be done with it. Some of the other things that we're seeing in Washington state, um, I was um, there about a year ago, uh, got up in the morning, wanted to get a Starbucks. So, and when I went downstairs to the hotel, I was like, can I get a Starbucks in town? They're like, no. I'm like, wait, well, you don't have Starbucks in town? This was a pretty good sized community. Uh, Moses Lake, as a matter of fact. And uh, they said, no, we don't have a Starbucks, but right across the street from us is a little drive through coffee shop that you can go get coffee at. So when I went to the coffee shop and I drove up and I said, OK, I'd like to get a decaf mocha with uh, coconut milk. I know. Why do I drink that? Because it's got no value in it whatsoever. But um, and they said, we don't have coconut milk. We've got almond milk. We've got soy milk or we can make your coffee with CBD oil. I'm like, OK, so I can get products from cannabis or from um, um, and CBD or THC, but I can't get a um, almond milk or a coconut milk, which was kind of amazing for me. In Colorado right now, they are manufacturing salsa wa seltzer water with CBD oil in it. These are things that you need to be on top of. You need to figure out where it's coming from. Are they creating the CBD oil themselves? Is it being supplied to them by somebody else? 
The other big concern that we have across the country right now with uh, CBD and THC are growers. Several states are having issues with growers, the, how they grow the, uh, the plants, whether it's marijuana or hemp. Uh, it's how do they grow it, where do they grow it, what kind of facilities do they have that they're making it, and are there any regulations around how they grow it? There are not, I'm just to let you know. And then of course there's edibles. Uh, every, a lot of companies or a lot of, of um, systems across the country are starting to have issues with the uh, production of edibles, the production of um, brownies and whatever else they make that is edible with the THC and CBD. And now in Arizona, they'll be able to make all of those edibles with both. So be aware of that. Colorado right now, another one is microbreweries. Microbreweries are showing up and you need to make sure that your pretreatment ordinance has some regulations about microbreweries, which I'm sure it does, on their BOD loading, their, T, their TSS loading, their fat cells and grease loading, because almost every one of those uh, microbreweries that I'm aware of has some type of a restaurant attached to it. It might be a pizza place, it might be a hamburger place, but something else that they're doing within that microbrewery. Those of you that are fortunate that don't have a bunch of microbreweries in town uh, are lucky. Bend, Oregon, the last count that I had on Bend, Oregon, population somewhere around 100,000 people and they have 26 microbreweries in town. And microbreweries are huge on BOD loading, huge on TSS loading, and you need to make sure that you're on top of those. You need to make sure that you have some kind of a um, not one assessment that you can pay and get them to pay for their amount of loading that they're sending to you. Those are things that are going on. And then the list just keeps going on and on and on. And nobody knows what's next. Who knows what's next, and especially in the CBD and the THC oil. I've got a friend up in Arizona that's a hairdresser, and I was trying to find out if she was going to start uh, providing uh, CBD and THC to her clients when they come in to have their hair dyed and it turns blue and she needs to calm them down. It's like, well, here, smoke this. Maybe you'll feel better afterwards. That's the things that we're starting to see going on. And and don't get me wrong, hairdressers, are, as far as I know, are not doing that. But that was just a um, um, challenge for what I'm trying to figure out is what's next. You always got to be thinking, what is next? What's the next thing that the American public uh, population is going to come up with. How are they going to figure out some other way to ingest uh, CBD or THC? They're even putting it in beer now. So you can actually get beer with THC in it and see it. Well, CBD, I don't know about the THC part. It's all of those things are happening. So, and of course, current issues is how do we get all that stuff out of the system? How do we, how do we, um, how do we plan ahead? It's like the last speaker said, you know, you have to start planning ahead. You got to start looking at what is coming down the line that's going to be having an effect on us. Talked about endocrine disruptors and uh, the uh, wastewater in different places like Park City and some of those places that are doing some studies on it. Up in Montana, they did a study on the 140 chemicals that's on the EPA's list for the PPCP list. Uh, and they did 14 different municipalities. They did tests on their wastewater to figure out what was in it. And the most prevalent chemicals in that particular part of the country were the chemicals that were used to make Prozac. So in my opinion, that means everybody in that part of Montana is depressed. Uh, maybe not, but I mean, I'm, I'm not sure why they would be because the only thing they have to do is get up every morning and go fishing. But um, I pick on Montana a lot just because I spend a lot of time up there. And um, so those are the things that you need to start looking at. Glyphosate is one of those things that's being found in wastewater discharge streams right now. And glyphosate, for those of you that don't know that chemical compound, basically it's Roundup. Roundup or 2,4-D. So it's a, pest, it's a uh, herbicide that's showing up in wastewater streams across the country in different places, may not be in your area. Um, and of course, your pretreatment regulations are all being driven by the Clean Water Act. Uh, and I think that was addressed in your last uh, uh, presentation. 
The thing that I want all of you to, re to remember, which you probably already have this uh, chiseled in your brain, is the thing, reasons that you can enforce what you can't enforce, and that is protection of the POTW. That publicly owned treatment works is something that you are basically signed up to treat to protect the best that you can in any way, shape, or form. And then, of course, in that Clean Water Act, there are, of course, are rights and privileges. The rights are that if it's domestic, they can discharge it to you. And and you can't really refuse to to bring in uh, pre-domestic uh, waste. Pre and indus industrial is then a privilege, which the previous speaker talked about. When they have people that want to come in and bring businesses into town, you have the right to refuse it if you want to, or regulate it, or do um, special assessments, or however you need to make it more feasible for your POTW to handle. If they're loading you up with a lots of uh, BOD, then that is something that you want to be charging them for. And it's really interesting because in the last couple of years, uh, probably more like four years now, we've seen places, uh, municipalities that have let meatpacking plants come to town. If you have a meatpacking meat packing plant come to your community, and you don't have some regulation, some pretreatment regulation on them, then you're going to be in for a lot of issues with that. We had one in Montana that his, he didn't know the meatpacking plant was coming to town. I don't know why, but he didn't. And when they showed up, his influent BOD went from about 230 up to over 1,000 influent BOD at his wastewater plant. And most of that was coming from the meatpacking plant. When they start slaughtering those beef, and there are processes that they should be doing with how they use the skin, the hides, the the the, um, the kill floor, the blood that they're getting off the kill floor, all of that should be regulated by your pretreatment ordinance. And they didn't have that, so they went back to the meat packing plant and said, "Okay, you need to put in a pretreatment program." And, and the meat packing plant said, "No." You didn't have that ordinance when we got here, so we are grandfathered in, which there's no such thing as grandfathered in. But anyway, we're grandfathered in. We don't have to meet that ordinance. And then it went to the attorneys. And at this point, I still don't know whether or not they forced the meat packing plant to put in some kind of a pretreatment program, at least for the kill floor, all the blood and hair and stuff that's coming off the kill floor into that wastewater plant. So it is an issue for you to be on top of and be aware of that those things are happening. Anything is household is a right. Anything that is commercial is a privilege. And you have to go back and look at your pretreatment program, your pretreatment ordinance. And I'm saying that especially in Arizona with the advent or with the approval of recreational marijuana and those uh, dispensaries starting to show up, which means you're going to have more growers and you need to know where they're growing it, how they're growing it, and whether or not that's going to have an impact on your uh, wastewater system. So be sure that you you re, that you re revisit your pretreatment, especially in Arizona right now. I'm going to recommend that every city needs to go back and look at their pretreatment ordinance. If you haven't looked at it in the last year, you need to go do that. You need to figure out are some of these entities that are going to be coming to town going to have a detrimental effect on your plant? Um, and of course, the pretreatment is basically trying to keep harmful pollutants from your wastewater system. And I think when you start looking at the um, medicines and all of that radioactive material and stuff like that that's in some wastewater plants, that's a pretty significant issue. So. Um, so basically what your objective is, is to prevent interference with your system. And so your pretreatment ordinance is, is a part of, or should not include, but you should have a fat soles and grease ordinance. You should have a pretreatment ordinance and they should be two separate documents as far as I'm concerned. Don't try to do them both in the same one because pretreatment could be hospital waste. It could be all kinds of other waste that could be summoned into your system. And fat soles and grease basically is more um directed towards restaurants and those types of entities that are creating lots of fat soils and grease now what a meat packing plant should fall under that one you're gonna have to kind of play by ear because you're getting a lot of fats 
uh, and oils and grease from a meatpacking plant with all the slaughtering that they're doing and those materials that might be ended up in your wastewater plant. What we're really trying to do is improve the opportunities for reuse, and that is a big thing in the United States right now, is reuse of wastewater. How can we reuse that water? Where can we, where, what can we do with it? Besides put it on crops, can it be turned into drinking water? Eventually it can with enough uh, treatment. You can actually take wastewater and turn it into drinking water. Uh, it's potable water with enough treatment. Um, I was reading an article here not too long ago that there's a city in New York, not New York City, but there's a city in New York that they figure by the time that water comes out of the tap at that particular municipality, it's already been through seven human beings. So you, that's what we need to do. How do we get that water? How do we get that water uh, to where it's reusable? Because water is the most critical um natural resource on this planet today most of you are already aware of that look at what's going on in texas right now with the water situation down there uh, not just the power but the water itself too so water is critical and we got to try to create as much safe drinking water as we possibly can and that's where your pre-treatment program uh, ordinances can come in to help with that so so what are we trying to do? We're trying to meet objectives, water from houses, commercial buildings, all this kind of stuff needs to be in your pre-treatment. How do we get this stuff um, to be easier for your sanitary, your POTW to, um, to clean? And how do we do that? Is it by regulating those toxins that may be coming in from different places? Um, and so you, you got to look at how do we how do we make everything that's going into the POTW the least costly for the POTW to process. And, and one of the thing, things that has come up recently, and I don't know, uh, this one was kind of an interesting to me because we talk about um, the POTW and trying to protect it and we're talking about microbreweries and the effects that they're having on POTWs with BOD loading and TSS loading and in some cases fat soles and grease loading but then also we have to look at distilleries I have a system in Utah that gets killed off almost um, I can almost put it on the calendar once a month they get killed off with just the waste from a distillery now I don't know if it's because of the way they're cleaning the the tanks or uh, the supposition is that it has something to do with the materials that they use to distill alcohol. One of which really uh, highly toxic sugar compound, but unless and but the community doesn't want to put anything, any restrictions on the distillery because they don't want the distillery to leave town. And they're like, well, if we put a bunch of restrictions on them or we start hitting them with a bunch of fines or special assessments, then they might not be here anymore. And they're kind of a revenue generator for this small community in Utah. So establishing an approved program, of course, you have to have key elements. So you have to establish your legal authority. And that legal authority is in um, EPA rule 40 CFR. Um, and it's 401 A, B, C, and D, I think, are the numbers. Um, you have to get, that's your authority. You just have to use the EPA. And then, of course, your state ordinances. Uh, all of those are things that you can use for establishing your authority to uh, create a pretreatment program and I'm showing I'm throwing that out there because even today um, this is uh, today with all of the knowledge we have about uh, uh, wastewater and contaminants and wastewater and the stuff that's hitting wastewater and now with uh, with COVID and all of the uh, the DNA sampling is being done to see how much COVID is ending up in wastewater plants. Even today, I still have communities tell me that they don't have the authority to establish a pretreatment program or they don't have the authority to establish a fat soles and grease program. And yes, you do. You have the authority to do that. You just have to write it and say, these are the rules. This is the EPA rules for um, me establishing a pretreatment program. And because of that, then we can also assess you for special assessments on loading. But if you don't have a pretreatment program, then you're going to come into this situation like we had up in Montana. Actually, it happened twice, once in Montana and once in Wyoming, where 
a meatpacking plant came to town and had a significant detrimental effect on how the wastewater plant was operating just because of the BOD and TSS loading that was coming in. And they didn't have a pretreatment ordinance. Um, so I'm going to say again, you have to take and maintain an inventory of every facility in your city or community, whatever it is, and look for SIUs, which are significant industrial users, but not just SIUs, but also IUs, because most of your marijuana grow operations and your um, uh, hemp grow operations are going to fall under an industrial user, not necessarily a significant industrial user. And so you want to look at those also to see where are they going to be, what are they going to be doing, and um, what can we do to regulate some of the things that they're going to be using. Um, of course, regulating the disposal of wastewater is something that we've been doing for decades. Make sure that your all of your facilities comply with the federal, state, and local pretreatment regulations. They cannot comply to a local pretreatment regulation if you don't have one. So that, that's something that you have to make absolutely sure that you have today, and you have to make sure that it's been reviewed, especially in, the, in Arizona within the last year. You need to go back and look at that and review it and make sure that it's going to meet what's coming your, your way in the future. Of course, safety of the public is always, always, always the primary focus for a pretreatment ordinance. It's how, how do we protect the public? How do we protect the POTW? And how do we make sure that everything that's going on is in the best interest of the general public itself? Um, if you don't have a program now, you need to make it a goal of your organization. If you have not reviewed your pretreatment ordinance in the last year, especially in Arizona, I keep picking on Arizona, but especially in Arizona, you need to go back and revisit it and you need to make sure that it's covering a lot of the things that may not necessarily be in there. So having a pretreatment program, basically what it does is it helps you to keep your plant running better, keep some of the contaminants out of your plant. I have not figured out a way, and I don't think anybody else is, how to prevent the sanitary wipes that are coming into the system. We do know that they are having a detrimental effect on the wastewater systems, not just in plugging or clogging uh, lift stations and pumps and all of those kind of things that are happening by sanitary wipes because they, they don't break down. They are they have nylon reinforcement in them. They cause all kinds of issues at lift stations and, and with grinder pumps and everything else. The other thing that we have have noticed in the last year uh, with COVID is, is a lot of those sanitary wipes and the chemicals that people are using to wash their hands, uh, sanitize with, that they're having an issue with those uh, having a detrimental effect on the wastewater plant. And we're seeing nitrification becoming an issue in many small systems. If you have a bunch of sanitary wipes in your system, you really want to watch your nitrifiers because they are really um fragile they're probably the most fragile bacteria in your entire wastewater system and anything can kill or or prevent them from doing the work that they want to do everything from ph levels to toxins to um temperature as most of you have noticed and maybe not in arizona because it's always hot there but i say that just because i used to live there when i left arizona the reason i left arizona is because i wanted to have more seasons than two which were hot and hotter in my estimate. And I'm just picking on Arizona, sorry about that. Um, but you have to be prepared for all of these chemicals that are gonna be hitting your system and they're coming off of the sanitary wipes themselves and they're coming off of the hand, so the hand cleaners that people are using on a regular basis. Then I have a class that I teach on sanitary wipes and you would be amazed what we humans do with sanitary wipes today that are not necessarily uh, on the label of what you should be doing with them. Of course, uh, pretreatment programs, again, things that are could be coming your way. Truck, uh, truck, truck washes are a big one. Car washes are another one that we're seeing significant impacts with from the fats, uh, from the hydro, petroleum hydrocarbons that are in those in industries and how are those regulated? and are they recirculating those and are they cleaning those um, sand filters that they use at a car wash? Are those being cleaned regularly and properly? And those are things that you need to be looking at in your pretreatment ordinance also is where is this stuff? What are they doing with these? 
And the other one that you want to be really on top of is dumper, is uh, septic haulers and, and uh, grease haulers. You have to make sure that your pretreatment ordinance has something in it that uh, relates to septic haulers. Where is that material coming from? Is it manifested? How long has it been since it was last tested? Uh, are you pulling grab samples of those before you dump them in your wastewater plant? All things that you need to have in your pretreatment regulations and ordinances. And of course, fassels and grease is another one. Um, additional treatment, I'm mean, just some of the ones that I'm going to tell you. Distillers and breweries, I've already talked about about those distillers right now. I, I don't know what it is and, and what they make that kills a wastewater plant, but it's happening all the time. Cannabis growing operations, of course, are going to be a, a, a entity for you. Hemp growing operations, another one. Processors, how do they process that? If it's a grower, are they processing it? Are they just selling the raw materials? Are they processing it? Are they turning it into some kind of an edible? Are they uh, um, making it something that should be falling underneath your fat, oils, and grease program, which if they're manufacturing edibles, uh, then yeah, it should fall under probably your fat, oils, and grease uh, program. But where are they making that stuff at? Are they making it in a commercial kitchen or are they just doing it in their house? Or is it a cottage industry for somebody? Um, and then of course, CBD, uh, eatable manufacturing. And, and yes, I did spell it two different ways there. And the reason I spelled it two different ways there is edible means you consume it, can consume it, and you might get somewhat of an enjoyment from that. Eatable means it's something that won't kill you when you eat it. So those are the two definitions. That's the difference in them. But so you, these are things that you, you need to be on top of. Every candy shop, if they're making any kind of an edible manufacturing or eatable manufacturing, you need to be on top of those, make sure they're either covered under your fat, oils, and grease ordinance or under your pretreatment ordinance. And then of course, then there's the other things that are out there that we're now seeing CBD uh, concoctions for animal nutrition, manufacturing CBD oils and salves. Where are those being made? How are they making them? What's the process? Are those oils being, uh, being disposed of properly? And then there's this, the all of these manufacturing facilities, how are they handling the the um, material that they can't get rid of? What are they doing with the um, uh, non usable portion of those oils and those salves that they're making? Or if they make a batch that's not uh, uh, readily available, that they can't get rid of it. The CBD oil has to be at 0.005 uh, micron, microns for before it can be uh, distributed or sold because of the absorption rates of it. And there's actually companies now that make a testing equipment to test down to make sure that that uh, CBD oil has the right uh, consistency to be used. And if it doesn't have, can they reprocess it more or do they just dispose of it? And when they dispose of it, where do they dispose of it? Is it going in the trash can or is it going down the uh, pipe to your wastewater plant? Those are all things that need to be considered when you're looking at your pretreatment. Some of the things that you want to be aware of, the byproducts of CBD oil uh, manufacturing are, of course, CO2, hydrocarbons, ethanol, butane, propane, those are all things that they use to extract and make CBD oil. So they're all byproducts of what could be ending up in your wastewater system. Um, so that's why you have to be on top of them. THC, post-extraction materials, same thing. Butane, ethanol, acetone, pesticides. Those are all things that be, could be coming in in your uh, the extraction of THC. So you, again, I can't stress enough how you've got to get on top of this, especially in states where you don't have these things uh, uh, previously. Commercial kitchens and manufacturing, failed edibles, what do they do with them? Where do they discard that product? I already kind of hit uh, on that a little bit. Um, you guys ever have that issue where your phone goes off when it's not supposed to? even though you turned it off. So, sorry about that. Um, so, edibles are basically what do they do with the failed ones. What do they do with the oils, the waxes, the 
ancillary manufacturing waste that comes off of that material. And that basically means you got to go in and say, how are you creating these edibles and have them give you the process of how they're being made? Um, and then, of course, and the and those that they were there before that picture before is those are actually edibles that um, that are out there in the marketplace today. Um, they, I mean, some of those look pretty good to me. I'd I'd almost eat that lime chocolate bar there. That's, uh, of course, never done some of that. And then, of course, there's companies like Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory that make uh, just chocolate. And I have talked to them. They are not making anything with CBD oil or THC, but they um, they are a candy manufacturer. So you need to go talk to all of those. Uh, your city pretreatment ordinance need to be reviewed. And that's also your fat soils and grease ordinance needs to be reviewed, not just the THC or not just the uh, pretreatment, but also your fat soils and grease. Is it going to take into consideration those you know, those municipal those companies that are just manufacturing edible products? Okay. Um, make sure you review them and change them if you need to, and uh, get into some of those. Some of the things that should be included in your pretreatment ordinance. This is just a short list. Car and truck washes I already talked about. Dennis we talked about in the last presentation. Um, industrial loading, where the where it's coming from, whether it's meat packing or turkey rendering, or and there are some systems in in Arizona that I mean, I was in a meat packing plant in Arizona a few years ago, and you know they were killing four thousand head of cows a day at that facility. They had their own wastewater treatment plant, which is what you would hope that they would have. Um, they were really proud of the fact that they used every bit of the cow except for the moo. And I was like, well, that's kind of an interesting. But that was like, yeah, we use everything except the moo. I'm like, oh, OK. So distillers and brewers are something that you have to be on top of food and beverage manufacturers. Are they going to start including THC and CBD oil in their manufacturing? And where is that product coming from? And are they manufacturing it on site? Of course, metal works has always been a pretreatment issue. Um, any business in this industry that is sending the product to you that has the potential to load your system with either BOD or TSS should be either included in your fat cells and grease ordinance or in your pretreatment ordinance. And then one that a lot of places miss is system to system. And that's like if you have a small community that is discharging to your community, what are you doing to regulate what they're sending you? Are you regulating the uh, BOD and TSS that they're sending you to your system? Are you regulating the H2S that's coming into your system? Are you regulating the, um, if they have a, a menu, a grower in their community that's growing um, either hemp or, or marijuana, are you regulating whether, how they, just, how you get materials from them? Is it loaded with uh, fertilizers or pesticides? Those things can end up in your system coming from a satellite community that's just feeding into you. So you got to make sure that you have those things under control too. Um, and of course, it's all of the things that are uh, on this list of things that you should be um, uh, aware of. Meat packing plants are big in, in the West, not necessarily in Arizona, although you do have a really big one down there. Um, you're supposed to protect the building and the safety of personnel from H2S. So that's the other thing that you need to look at in your pretreatment is, is, is this pretreatment going to create some kind of an H2S issue? And I'm going to be teaching a class at um, Tri-State this year specifically around pretreatment and H2S. And is, a, is H2S a critical issue for uh, those of you that are in the pretreatment world? Yes, it is. And you need to be on top of it because that stuff will kill you in one breath if you're not careful. So you got to make sure that you um, um, are looking at H2S as an issue from anything that's being sent to your system and especially on the pretreatment side because it'll show up in places like you will not expect it to be. Um, of course, H2S is, a, is now on the EPA's hit list. It's one of those things that they're trying to figure out the last time I talked to them. Um, they're trying to figure out how to regulate H2S, the, the influent and effluent H2S um, that's in wastewater. 
you know, I don't think it's so much the effluent that they're concerned about, it's the influent, but how do we get that under control and uh, make sure that people don't get injured or die from H2S? Now, some of your biggest issues in fat cells and grease and uh, toxins, the hospitals are already on there for nursing homes. Those are big, huge grease producers for your community. Any apartment complex is a, is a huge grease producer. Nursing homes are huge grease producers. Hospitals, huge grease producers. Mobile home parks are huge grease producers. When I talk to communities and I say, you know, where's your biggest grease issue? Every, almost every time they're saying it's at the apartment complex and the mobile home park. Things that we have no control over. We can control restaurants but we do not have the ability so much to control an apartment complex. Although there are ways to build into your building code, code a way to kind of get a little bit of the fat cells and grease from apartment complexes under, um, under control. If you want to know more about that, just give me a call and I'll tell you how some of the communities are starting to deal with that. Of course, any school, any kind of academic institution is a huge grease producer if they're making lunches. Um, and even today, there are places, there are schools that are still making lunches, but they don't have any kids in class. Uh, I was just in um, New Mexico last week and meeting with some communities there, and they're having their their schools are still creating meals. They just don't have any any students in class, so they're still loading that that system up with fats, oils, and grease and the things that come from creating. Uh, meals, even though there are no kids there. Now, what they're doing is creating meals for those kids, and then they're delivering to the homes in that community to those kids so that they still get a hot lunch, which I think is is applaudable. They should uh, be commended for that. But again, just because the school's not in business as far as teaching doesn't mean that they're not still creating uh, systems or um, uh, food products for the uh, students of that um, uh, community. Let's talk about cannabis and hemp growers. Whether they're small or large manufacturers, each will create a different issue for you. And these are just some some uh, pictures of a really nice marijuana plant, I guess. That's what that is. I don't know what marijuana plant looks like, but that's probably it. And then, of course, grow operations. And a lot of those are being done in greenhouses right now. Um, in California, some cities in California now have gone in and required that these greenhouse growers, that they seal every floor drain in the greenhouse. And the reason they want that floor drain uh, sealed is because the fertilizers that they may be using to grow these crops, the uh, pesticides that they may be using, to the insecticides, the herbicides, all of that kind of stuff that they may be using. If any of that hits the floor and it's washed down a floor drain, a lot of times those floor drains go to your uh, POTW. You do not want to have your system getting loaded up with nitrates and phosphates and um, glyphosate and such a roundup and that kind of stuff. You don't want that kind of uh, material hitting your wastewater plant if you can prevent it. One of the best ways is big grow operations like this. And this one actually looks like a small one. Uh, I saw one the, here up in Nebraska recently that it covers about, between, with all of the greenhouses they have on site, they have about 50 acres of greenhouses that they're growing um, cannabis in. So just um, for you to be aware of that. Now the recreational growers, I don't know how you're gonna get those under control other than your your drug enforcement may have a limit on how many plants that they can have on site, uh, depending on how it's written. Every state is different, um, but and depends on whether they're doing hydroponic or conventional growing. Are they? If they're doing hydroponic, everything's being grown in water, which that water is supposed to be recycled, reused over and over and over again. If they're doing um, conventional growing, like in a greenhouse, they have. Uh, those plants are in pots, they're in soils, and they're uh, maybe can maybe using uh, fertilizers such as nitrates and phosphates that you don't want to have hitting your system. You have to have this under control. The fertilizers and the pesticides in any growing operation you have to have under control. It's like when you go in and do your pre-treatment uh, survey of a of any type of business, you need to know what are the chemicals that they're using to do whatever it is they're doing. What are the chemicals 
chemicals they're using to make that product and what are the chemicals that they're using to clean after that product is over, after it's been made. I have a system in, um, in Oregon that he gets killed off usually about once a week. He gets killed off. Uh, he uses all of his nitrifiers and I keep like, why are you losing these? What kind of industry do you have in town? We don't have any industry, although we do have this one area where all of the manufacturers of CBD and THC uh, manufacture their, all their products in, in one area of town. And I was like, OK, so what kind of cleaning solutions are they using? What are those solutions going to have an effect? Because if they're going in and cleaning once a week or every day, how's it how's it having an effect on you? And actually, in his case, it's every day. It's almost at four o'clock every day. He has a significant hit on his on his uh, nitrifiers. I said it was a one, but every day he gets hit. And, and my my suspicion is it's probably coming from those uh, food manufacturers that are in that one particular area of his community um that are using the th different things different cleaning solutions the other one that you want to be really care uh, cautious of is quad ammonia or quad amines if you go in and look at your restaurants and your facilities and especially these new operations that are coming up what are they using for cleaning solutions what is in those cleaning solutions what's on the label um if it says quaternary amines on it it could be detrimental to how your wastewater plant runs we see that especially out in the in the east uh, coast where they're doing a lot of canning of beans and and corn and whatever they can out there which i have no idea it could be strawberries for all i know but um yeah any other canning operations they've had to start looking at those and saying okay your cleaning solutions we got to eliminate quaternary amines in your cleaning solution because they are killing our wastewater plant so um and the other thing that you want to be aware of is, is the EPA does not have any restrictions around what fertilizers and what pesticides can be used on the growing of uh, hemp and, um, and cannabis. Now, California has adopted, has basically adopted the same rules around those two particular uh, plants as they do around most of their agricultural products but most of them do not have any re regulation and a lot of the reason for that is is because the states don't want to get involved in it because the, the, the feds still do not um, identify uh, cannabis and hemp as a as a crop so a lot of states have not adopted any kind of restrictions around what materials can be used to grow them because the feds have not uh, established a rule around what can be used to grow them and most of the uh, the uh, products that you can buy for fertilization and pesticide control do not they have all kinds of things on their label about how much to use to grow corn and beans and wheat and alfalfa and strawberries and all of those different crops but they don't have anything on the label that tells you how much to use when you're growing cannabis growing cannabis and hemp so those are some of the other issues that you want to be aware of. Effects on your wastewater, nitrification loading for one, phosphorus loading, uh, denitrification, it might have an effect on your denitrification also. If you um, don't have, if your system doesn't have enough organic carbon in it to denitrify, could be an issue for you. Plant kill offs for, uh, as an effect on your wastewater, um, and, and I would, hope that all of you would agree even though it's pre-treatment all of you would agree that if your plant gets killed off that's what we call really bad juju so you don't want to have your plant die because then you're out of compliance and then you have to start writing letters to um, uh, deq and it just becomes a huge issue for you of course bod loading and tss loading are some of the other effects that you're going to have in your wastewater system and in a lot of states right now they are starting to look at phosphorus as a part of the mpds and phosphorus reduction so you definitely do not want to be loading your plant up with any kind of phosphorus from any of those growing operations that may be coming to town of course processors again uh, fat soles and grease what are the cleaning solutions that they're using and that should be a part of your normal annual pre-treatment survey that you do on every business in town 
is you need to know what kind of cleaning solutions they're using. What does the label say? Um, you need to know that because it will have an effect on your plant if it comes if it gets into high concentrations. Uh, of course, BOD loading, TSS loading, uh, and I already talked about what what we refer to as quad or quad ammonia. I was working with a system up in the cent uh, central uh, Arizona a few years ago, and the superintendent called me and she said. I've got this metal finisher in town that's got this five gallons of product that he needs to get rid of for in his metal finishing process. And he wants to know if he can just pour it down the um, the drain to the wastewater plant, which I was really amazed that that manufacturer actually called her before he just dumped it on her. But um, and I said, well, what's in it? She said, I don't know. They won't tell me. I'm like, what do you mean they won't tell you? said, well, when I call the company that when I asked for the label, they sent me the label. It doesn't have anything about what's in it. it just says it's a pro proprietary blend. Uh, I called the manufacturer. They won't tell me how it's made, what's in it or anything that's in there. And so I said, well, give me the phone number. So I called the manufacturer and I spent about 45 minutes on the phone with this manufacturer saying, what is in this product that this guy wants to dump on the wastewater plant? I need to know what's in it. And and they're like, well, we can't tell you that that's proprietary information. And I'm like, well, but they're getting ready to discharge this to a wastewater plant. And after about 45 minutes, he says, well, is this is this going to go into a municipal wastewater plant? And I said, yeah, that's kind of the conversation we've been having. He said, oh, you should never you should never dump this on a municipal wastewater plant. It'll kill it. And I'm like, OK, maybe that should be on the label that it should not ever be, you know, uh, disposed of in a municipal wastewater plant. I don't know, still to this day, I have no idea what was in that uh, product that they were using in that metal furniture, but um, even the manufacturer said, oh, you don't want to do that. Um, it's my recommendation that every business in town, every new one should have a sampling port on their wastewater system so that you can pull samples regularly. You can pull samples and check for BOD and COD and TSS nitrogen compounds, phosph uh, phosphates, fog. And the reason that I say that is because of the story I was telling you about the community in Washington that now every gas station in town evidently is a dispensary for um, the THC and CBD oil. And we, so you as a pretreatment coordinator need to know what all of those businesses are doing. And just because it says it's a Lowe's or a Home Depot today does not mean it's going to be a Lowe's or a Home Depot next week. So that's why I want a sampling port on everyone. And yes, it's gonna cost them money to put those in, but I think it would be in your best interest if you have those. Um, and it's up to you to decide whether or not you wanna change your building code to require that they be put in. Um, you can also say about any remodeling. Same thing with fat soles and grease. You can say every restaurant in town has to have a grease interceptor, and a lot of them will come back to you and say, well, we've been here for 50 years, so we don't have to abide by your fat soles and grease ordinance. And that's where your ordinance has to say if they do any kind of re any kind of remodeling, change of ownership, anything along that line on that fat on that restaurant that they have to then put in a grease interceptor you just have to write it into your building code or into your business um, um, uh, licensing code that they have to have that thing in that in place uh, but it's up to you to make that happen um, these are just some ideas that i'm throwing out to you i am going to say that i uh, and i mentioned this earlier h2s in pretreatment those of you, I hope that everybody that is working in pretreatment in your particular municipality has their own individual handheld H2S de detector because you, you are going to be going into situations where you need to know if there's H2S gas there because it is highly deadly at a thousand parts per million. You're instantaneously dead. Um, and I, I I can harp on H2S for hours, um, but I'm really not wanting to have to talk about people that died because they went into an environment and they didn't test the atmosphere before they went in first. Just so you know, they have done testing on grease interceptors. So if you happen to be a part of the fog program for your community and you're checking grease interceptors, you need to know that they've say, have measured H2S at levels as high as a thousand parts per million underneath the lid of a grease interceptor in the alley. That's why I'm highly um, 
uh, motivated to get all of you to start making sure that you have a handheld uh, H2S detector. And they've got now they've got lone worker detectors and all kinds of stuff that are testing four different gases and lone worker detectors, which those are the ones I kind of like right now. And I can't remember the name. It's Black Line, I think, is the name of the company. Uh, but if you don't have one and your community refuses to buy you one and you're in pretreatment, have you have the mayor call me. I'll be more than happy to have a conversation with him or the town council member or your individual supervisor. You should not be working anywhere in the wastewater industry that you do not have a handheld H2S detector on your person at all times and make sure that it's turned on. And these are just some corrosion issues that we've seen from H2S. And this is one, this one's one of my favorite ones, this door. Because I, I had a, uh, a gentleman in, a, in and ironically, it was in a Region 8 EPA class, uh, EPA uh, conference, and I was teaching a class, and one of the guys in the uh, Region 8 uh, EPA said, well, you know, that's just sodium. That's a, That picture was taken in the Pacific Northwest. I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea, except for the fact that this particular uh, wastewater headworks building is about 40 miles west of El Paso, Texas. So I'm pretty sure that that's not sodium contamination on that door. It's probably H2S contamination that's converted to sulfuric acid. So uh, it's always uh, it's always fun to go teach for uh, government agencies. Um, and of course, if you're in re if you're in pretreatment and you're out there and you're doing, and and again, it's about awareness. It's about what you see out there in the world that you got to be careful of. This is a lift station down in. Uh, uh, this lift station actually is in Arizona, and you can see that the um, um, the vent the pipe coming out of that lift station has been deteriorated, and and you can see the sodium buildup, the, the sulfur buildup on the paddle locks on the on the the um, um, the lift station. I mean, these are things that if you're in pretreatment. I and mean, you should be looking at you should be checking and if you see this kind of stuff it should be a red flag to you that there's something going on um if you decide to not use your uh, uh h2s detector that's your choice but just be aware that you are making a life and death decision anytime you enter a confined space and enter the back room of any building any commercial operation any manufacturing process and when you decide to enter that room with that building or that room without your H, without your hand held on, um, yeah, it could be detrimental for you. Um, and then, of course, uh, I can always go into my smart stuff and uh, um, smart and stuff and stupid stuff. Um, stupid stuff is I actually had a, a gentleman come up to me after a class in Oregon and said, um, our supervisor has told us that he will only send single employees into a confined space. And I'm like, an enclosed space. I'm like, he did what? He's like, yeah, he's only going to he's only going to send single employees into an enclosed space because he doesn't want to have to call the wife of any married guy that gets killed in the enclosed space. And I'm like, he actually said that <laughs> he's like, yeah, I'm like. And I couldn't read his name on his badge or the community that he's from because I would have been making phone calls as soon as my class was done. But um, yeah, you can't do that. That's that's an HR issue that needs to be addressed. Um, the other thing that I want you to be really aware of is steeped in tradition, which is in my case, you want to be really, really careful today. Anytime you're out doing pretreatment stuff, if somebody that you work with says I've been in that lift station, you know, 30 times in the last 30 years and there's nothing in there that will hurt you. That's the guy that will get you killed because just because he says you don't have to test it doesn't mean you have to. One of the things that we do know about wastewater today is that it is not what it was 30 years ago. The chemicals, the toxins, the amount of stuff that's hitting your wastewater system, whether it's in your collection lines, your lift stations, your head works, however you're processing in your pretreatment program, that material is not the same as it was 30 years ago. Everything is being changed. They're designing new chemicals all the time. And you have to be on top of whatever's happening out there in your industry and in your community. 
And this is the part where I'm trying to really scare the living crap out of you because I don't want to be telling somebody about how you died in a lift station. And Arizona's had a lot of those over the last few years. Um, they had uh, a couple of a couple of guys that got killed in Scottsdale just a couple of years ago working on a lift station. So you want to make sure that you, if you are an inspector, that you have your H2S detector with you at all times. I don't care what you're inspecting. If you're inspecting uh, dental amalgam traps, it doesn't matter. You should still have that H2S detector on you and, and don't turn it off because um, that happens too. In Nevada, a couple of years ago, they had a guy that ended up in the hospital and when they asked him why he didn't leave the area when his H2S detector went off at 300 parts per million, he said, oh, I didn't hear it because I'd turned the alarm off. Uh, yeah, you can't do that. And when they went back to the headquarters, uh, back to the plant operations and tested everybody, they, there were five other people that had turned the alarm off on their, H, their handheld H2S detectors. Those guys were... Um, were laid off without pay for a while because they had violated the the um, regulations that the the um, community had for safety. So they'd actually put themselves in harm's way. Um, the best one I ever worked with was a crew out of Seattle. Uh, everybody that was there uh, actually um, tested the atmosphere before they went in. There was five of us, four workers and myself. All four workers tested the atmosphere on that lift station before they went in. Uh, even the guy that wasn't going in, the guy that was uh, dropped his sniffer in, was monitoring the environment the whole time we were in there. Uh, and they wrote it on the wall. They had a log on the wall where they wrote all that down, the date, the time, who they were, what the H2S levels were at the time that they uh, tested it. Um, had a, a gentleman, one of my workers was actually in Washington and he was working with a fish processor, which would fall underneath your pretreatment ordinances. If you have somebody processing fish or turkey or beef or whatever, um, he was working with a fish processor. And when they were going out to um, to the uh, digester building, before they opened the door on the digester building, my employee's H2S detector was going off. And I was like, what'd you do? And he says, I, I told him I wouldn't go in there. So. I'm not going in there because I'm standing outside the building and my handheld H2S detector is telling me that the H2S is above 10 parts per million. Uh, I'm not going in there. And, uh, and and it was really kind of an interesting situation because it, it was a wastewater plant that had a greenhouse built over it. Why it had a greenhouse, I have no idea. But... Um, and he and he asked the guy, he says, how do you work in there? He said, well, I usually know it's just a circuit breaker that's uh, that's flipped. So I just take a really deep breath and I run inside the building and I flip the switch and I come back out. I'm like, yeah, that's a, that's a good um, um, practice for safety. Is I just take a deep breath before I go in the room. Um, I was there a couple of years ago and they'd actually dismantled the greenhouse because of Hopefully, because my employee said, "You got to get, you got to do something different here, because you're going to kill somebody before this is over with." Um, and of course, if you're in pretreatment, you got to be aware that you know H2S is highly explosive. It will, it's seven times more explosive than gasoline. So be careful where you are and what you're doing. Um, Every business should have a pretreatment survey. I've already talked about that. It's chemicals that they're using, how they're using, what are they using, what have they changed? When you go in and do your pretreatment survey on on the the local business in town, one of the first questions you should have on your pretreatment survey is, "What have you changed? Are you are you processing something different? Are you have you changed chemicals for cleaning? What are all of those things that have happened that you need to be aware of?" but it has to be on your pretreatment survey. You need to ask that question. What are you doing different today that you weren't doing last year or two years ago when we went through this pretreatment survey? And I'm sure all of you have those pretreatment surveys and you have been uh, religiously going out and doing those every year. But if you haven't, you need to start doing that. Any kind of cleaning solutions that they're using, what is the SDS, what's the label? Make sure you have copies of all that. Um, and that's just part of your um, safety that you need to be doing. Um, 
So distillers, these are some of my favorite pictures. Um, you know, the distillery waste, uh, there's a, uh, there's a uh, sugar that they make for distilling. Distilling, yeah, distilling. It's a molasses sugar combination that seems to have a detrimental effect on wastewater plants, especially small plants. Um, and it contains high BOD, high COD, TSSs, can have phosphates and sulfates and phenols and um, and other various toxins and metals in it that you need to be aware if you have any distillers in your distilleries in your particular uh, community. Uh, what are they doing? Are, and are they have is it organic or inorganic pollutions that they're putting on you? And just some of the byproducts that they're using there are you know, uh, dibutyl, benzene, uh, propanic acid, which I don't even know what that is, but, uh, you know, and many other, and all the other compounds that they use in distilling. And you need to be aware of what every one of those compounds is and what it does, and is it a toxin for your particular wastewater system. Microbreweries, again, I'm getting back into the same thing I've already talked about many, many times during this presentation is, you know, COD loading, BOD loading. Are you surcharging for the ex excess of that that they're adding to your system? Excess TSS loading, are you charging for that? Fat soles and grease loading, are you also charging surcharges for that? And if not, why not? And is it something that you should do or could do within your organization? Um, Every brewery should have an outfall for sampling port for sampling what they're sending you. You need to pull a sample at least every 30 to 90 days uh, and test for BOD loading, COD loading, fat soles and grease loading. Those are all things that you should be monitoring on any microbrewery that you have in your community. And again, I like to say, you know, Bend, Oregon has 26 of them in town. Uh, we figured out that you could go out and get drunk every night in in except Sunday every night except Sunday in Bend, Oregon and get drunk at a different brewery every night if you wanted to. Um, that's how many they have. So uh, are they requiring grease interceptors? Do they have one? Are you requiring it? Um, screens if possible to eliminate solids that the the grains and stuff that they use to microbrew with. What are they doing with the waste from that? Where's that waste going? And in a lot of cases now they're using it for food for like cattle and pigs and that kind of stuff and big microbreweries like new belgium and some of those they're actually taking that wasted um, grain and stuff and feeding it to cattle um you need to make sure that you inspect them on a regular basis and ensure that they're complying with your goals and i'm always amazed that microbreweries some of the names they come up with like this one is out of Montana. It's called Moose Drool. I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. Um, some of you may have even drank Moose Drool. Um, and then there's other, you know, microbreweries that do all kinds of things. There's one down in Southern Colorado. And this one, I just took this picture because of the name, which is, I thought was kind of interesting that they make a beer called Trashy Blonde. Um, and I was just like, hmm, kind of interesting. Edibles, pet food. Any pet food store you go into independent anymore, even some of the bigger ones like Petco and some of those now have edibles that they make for pets, CBD oil. And uh, I don't think they're doing THC yet for pets, but they are doing CBD oil. Um, have a system in Southern Colorado that uh, gets killed off about once a month just from the pet food manufacturer that's in town. They're actually making pet food and in the pet food process, some of the stuff that they're discharging is killing off the wastewater plant. And that is what part of what the pretreatment people should be monitoring for is what are they discharging and will it have a, a detrimental effect on the POTW? And you won't have an idea whether or not it'll have an effect on your POTW unless you make sure you're doing that survey annually of what they're doing, what chemicals they're using, what cleaning solutions they're using, and how is it having an effect on, how could it have an effect on the wastewater plant? Um, and I already said this, every business should have a, um, a sample port for chest testing, should do it every 90 days uh, minimum, I would say pull a sample. If it's a big high-end restaurant or a restaurant that is would be notorious for fat soles and grease, I would do it every 30 days. So any, and, and, and I'm going to, and not, I'm not trying to be um, a prejudice here, but if, if it's a Mexican restaurant, an Italian restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, um those are all huge grease producers can 
Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, Taco Bell, all huge grease producers. Any restaurant that caters to Wyomingites is a huge grease producer. And I say that tongue in cheek because I actually am from Wyoming. And I can tell you that when I was growing up, if it couldn't be fried, we didn't eat it in my house. So if my mother could have figured out a way to fry lettuce, she would have done it. But we ate fried rabbit, fried elk, fried steak, I mean, fried beef. Um, the other thing that I noticed, I realized about Wyoming is if it didn't have hooves, we didn't eat it. So yeah, that's not necessarily true today. But um, one of the things that they did, grease ordinance, of course, enforcement you need to make sure you enforce it religiously throughout the community you cannot have a grease ordinance and then not inspect the mayor's brother-in-law's restaurant that is it you can't do that you have to enforce it religiously across the community the other thing is you also all are also susceptible to uh, fines if you don't have a pretreatment ordinance so uh, Region 8 has actually started putting some teeth into their pretreatment fat soils and grease ordinance. Um, but other uh, regions are also looking at, you know, what do we do with um, if they don't have a pretreatment ordinance, you're susceptible to a $57,000 fine if you do not have one and you have an incident that requires EPA to show up. They can fine you $57,000 for not having a pretreatment ordinance. They can also fine you $57,000 for not having a fat soles and grease ordinance. So if nothing else, you have to make sure you have those in place. Okay. Um, and then if you decide not to enforce it on the on the mayor's brother-in-law's restaurant, um, you're all susceptible, uh, susceptible to a fine for not enforcing your own ordinance. So make sure that you have those. Um, and of course, these are just some of the things that should be in your pretreatment ordinances that you know, restaurants are not allowed to put anything in their system that liquefies grease. So if it's something that, if it's an enzyme and a degrease or any of that kind of stuff should be in your ordinance that they cannot use those because all they do is liquefy grease and put it in your pipe and then it'll solidify someplace down the line or it'll just send liquid grease to your wastewater plant. Some of you can handle that really well, 91st Avenue. Uh, if somebody was liquefying grease and sending it to them, they wouldn't even notice it. But if you happen to be a um, some small town in Arizona, a Casa Grande or something like that, a bunch of fat cells and grease hitting your system is going to have a detrimental effect on it. So one of those things that you have to be totally aware of and make sure that you have it in place. Um, and um, these are just some, um, if you want, Want some help writing an ordinance? Just let us know. There are lots of ordinance uh, um, um, templates out there that can be done. EPA Region 8 has a really great um, uh, pre pretreatment ordinance that they have put together that um, I would recommend using theirs. If you can get a hold of it, all you have to do is just call Region 8 EPA and say, um, yeah, I'd like to have a copy of your pretreatment ordinance and I'm sure that they will give it to you. Most cities, most big cities anymore, have really great fat soles and grease ordinances. Uh, some of my favorites are Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, Casper, Wyoming. Both of those have really good fat soles and grease ordinances that you can just take. You don't have to rewrite the whole thing. You just have to get on there and and change the name to protect the guilty and uh, uh, oh, I mean protect the innocent and um, just get it in place. Get the town council to sign off on it make sure that it meets all the requirements that it has to have. I will be more than happy to review it. If you want, just send it to us and we'll review it for you. That's and we won't charge you for that. So if you want us to re review your ordinance, we'd be happy to do that. Um, compliance issues, the things that you want to be looking at, of course, is some of the things that EPA and DEQ are looking at is new rules around ammonia and nitrates and phosphates, dischargers and producers, and how those things are going to have an effect on how your wastewater plant runs. Mercury amalgam is one of the big things that hit a couple of years ago. Uh, EPA had been working on that for, gosh, I think almost a decade before they actually got that in place. Um, every EPA meeting I went to, all they could talk about was mercury and amalgam. It was just like, wow, uh, we got to get this under control. And uh, so it took them a long time to get it done. The um, chemicals that uh, EPA wants you to start looking at is PPCP, which was 
um, uh, touch, uh, previous um, speaker touched base on, and that's some of these things that are showing up in wastewater systems, caffeine, and I didn't realize they drank that much caffeine uh, in, in Utah, maybe, um, but I, I am a non-caffeine drinker, so I don't know if that's, uh, but these are just, that's just a short list of the 140 chemicals that are on that uh, EPA's hit list right now. There's 140 chemicals, and they're trying to figure out some way to control those, some way to get you to have to to um, meet some kind of a discharge limit on that. And um, so you just have to be aware of what's going on. Um, and in some cases, if you are monitoring your BOD and your TSS loading and fat cells and grease loading and all that kind of stuff, you can actually start um, you know, assessing for that. And it's a special assessment. Um, and you just want to make sure that you can do that. Um, and, and I was working with a system out in New Jersey a couple of years ago. Their special assessment for BOD and TSS, because they were a small community that was discharging to a larger regional facility that was doing all the wastewater processing, their special assessment for that small community annually was three million dollars for BOD and three million dollars for TSS. So this little tiny, well, a little tiny, it's a pretty good sized community, but they were getting special assess six million dollars a year for the discharge that they were sending to the regional authority. So those are things that you need to look at. Um, how am I doing on time? Um, let's see. You um, have to. Have to... 11 o'clock. And what time is it now? 10 50. 10 Yeah, I, was, I don't know what time it is because I threw both of my cell phones out in the out in the lobby so I wouldn't have to hear them ring. So um sorry about, about that. I'm sure if you go a little bit over, we won't mind. You won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if I've got anybody's attention yet. That's the other challenge. Um, the, the national uh, statistics right now on fat soils and grease is 80% of the cost of, ma of managing fat soils and grease is done at the wastewater plant. The BOD loading, the TSS loading, the foaming, the power consumption, the chemicals, that all of that stuff, 80% of it's at the wastewater plant. So if you are in pretreatment and you want to help out your wastewater plant, planning the amount of, of um, money they're spending something for you to look at is how do we control that fat cells and grease that's hitting the wastewater plant pumper trucks are always an issue for me i mean i don't care who it, i don't care if it's a pumper truck that's pumping fat cells and grease or a pumper truck that's doing uh, um um well yeah septic tanks um you've got to be really careful with those guys about what they're bringing, especially the septic tank haulers what are they bringing you? Where's it coming from? Is it coming from a out in the middle of the world uh, crystal meth lab, which it very could be, very well could be, because there's a lot of uh, crystal meth uh, manufacturing that's now being done outside of the city. Um, they usually set up shop in some small community if they can, because there's no police presence. But we are now starting to see uh crystal meth showing up in wastewater plants and uh, crystal meth chemicals showing up in wastewater plants from uh pumper trucks that are hauling they're they're going out in the country they're pumping somebody's septic tank they don't pay attention to the 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 house that they're, they're just pumping the the chemi the uh, tank so some of that could be ending up in wastewater plants we're seeing in a little tiny bit of leftover chemicals from crystal crystal meth just to give you an idea one pound of crystal meth creates seven pounds of toxic waste and that toxic waste they need to get rid of and if they dump it in your collection system especially like at a um an rv park or a uh, if you happen to be taking on the wastewater from a um one of the state's facilities where they have rest areas and they have a um a way for um those haul the travelers to discharge if you're picking up any of that material it could have crystal meth chemicals in it which will kill your wastewater plant and there's no way to test for those we don't have any way to test for those chemicals right now or even which ones to test for because there's so many things that go in crystal meth 
um, everything from you know uh, battery acid to uh, anhydrous ammonia, you name it, that goes into crystal meth. And those chemicals can cause a detrimental effect on your wastewater plant. We see small systems across the country almost every year there we see small uh, systems across the country getting killed off with crystal meth uh, toxic hits. And one of the and so for those of you that are in small communities, which I don't know if any of you are, if you're in a small community, if you see the color of your wastewater system change, if it goes to a chalky pink or a chalky white and then goes black, that's a pretty good indication that you had some kind of a chemical toxic hit, probably crystal meth. So, um, and of course, some resources for you. Again, pre-treatment templates, I highly recommend Region 8 has a great one. I hope they still have it up on their website because I haven't talked to Al in a while, but uh, they have a really great uh, pre-treatment uh, ordinance that you should be, and they, again, you can plagiarize that. Fog ordinance templates, we have one available for you if you need it, or if you really want to uh, look at some of the more, the more stringent ones. Bismarck, North Dakota, I think, has one of the best pre-treatment uh, programs, one of the best uh, flushables programs, and one of the best uh, um, fat soils and grease programs I've ever seen. Uh, the guys at Bismarck have really been on top of it, and I can't remember the, that gentleman's name that's in charge of that right offhand, uh, but fabulous uh, work. I would also look at, at Bismarck's um, um, public awareness program that they have the teaching that they do about fat soils and grease, keeping grease out of the drain, don't flush pipe, pipe wipes down the pipes. Um, it is absolutely fabulous. And I think if you call them and ask them, they might even give you permission to use their stuff, but you need to call them first. Don't use it. Their graphics are fabulous. Um, so get just get on region, just get on Bismarck, North Dakota, and look at their program and see what they have that's uh, up there. It's it's uh, high, I highly recommend it. And then get them to give you permission if you can to use it. So uh, one of um, one of Al uh, Garcia, the pretreatment guy from Region Eight, I was listening to him talk one time, and one, and this statement is one that he had in his presentation and it stuck with me uh, for all of these years now that he was doing that and is that is is your community practicing the science of pretreatment or the art of pretreatment and what are the differences between the two and i would i would say that probably most of you are practicing the art of pretreatment because if you just practice the science of pretreatment it may not work the way you expect it to it's kind of like when they build you a wastewater plant are you built or is that wastewater plant being run the way the engineers built it or is it being run the way you have to make it run in order to get it to work um so it's always uh, and i i give al credit for this statement whenever i get a chance to use it so uh practice the art of pretreatment get out there get in get your feet dirt get your feet dirty and your hands dirty and get out there and do what you can to help people um move along better. Uh, for those of you in Arizona, Kelly is our is our rep for the Arizona area um, and she'll be happy to have a conversation with you. My phone numbers are up here. If you have any questions, uh, send a um, email to sales at biolensius.net um, or rick at biolensius.net or Kelly will be happy to answer any questions we can for you um, and uh, let us know what we can do to help and visit our website if you get a chance i think i'm done um, i'm going to open this up to questions, questions since there's quite a bit of feedback from, from people who are listening anybody wants to ask a specific question please do the hand raise or type in the chat and i will call on you And we always have um, the round table. I know I made some notes on sampling port vendors, um, trub for like brewery solids, um, pump out frequencies. Um, there are so many good topics. So if nobody wants to speak up, we can always discuss in the round table. Uh, Rick, are you gonna be hanging around? 
I will. How uh, the round table lasts? How long? Oh. Um, it's till noon. Till noon. Yeah, I, I can hang out for a while. Cool. Yeah. Um, OK, so thank you so much, Rick, for presenting. I think everybody learned a lot. Um, awesome. I've I've listened to part of your presentation before, and I feel like I learned even more this time. <laughs> well, good. Glad to hear that. So um, yeah, it's always good for, uh, if you learn something new. Um, now we're going to have um, Josh Ballantine. He is going to be moderating our procurement roundtable. And some of the topics will be um, breweries, beverages, unique facilities. And then there's a bunch of other topics that um, we have kind of listed to get the conversation going. Um, but Josh, if you want to um, turn on your camera and audio, and I don't know if you have any background or anything, it's not necessary, but one second. Let me know when you're ready for me to go. Sorry, one second. OK, I'm just pulling up the roundtable questions, which I sent to you. Um, you can. Let's see, you can get started now. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chelsea. Thanks, everybody at AZ Water. For, for letting me participate. I'm also speaking tomorrow, so feel free to uh, come back and uh, listen to, uh, uh, I think, some some recurring conversation that's going on through all the presentations today, and it's kind of permitting these non-traditional industrial facilities that may not truly be industries per se. Uh, maybe they're hospitals, maybe they're small craft breweries, maybe they're, uh, you know, they don't traditionally meet the the definition per se of an SIU, such as 25,000 gallons per day uh, or categorical industrial users, but they have some issues that uh, can cause problems. They have things that can cause problems at the wastewater treatment facility at the uh, in the collection system. Uh, maybe they have some uh, hazardous chemicals, things like that. So uh, come back and join us tomorrow uh, in, in tomorrow's session as well. There's going to be uh, some, some good presentations. So just so you know, I'm Josh Valentine. I may be a new face to some of you. Um, I, I've just recently gotten involved in AZ Water. I actually, uh, so I'm Brian and Caldwell's pretreatment uh, technical leader for the company. I am a uh, former pretreatment program manager. I managed the city of Memphis's pretreatment program for several years. I then went on to work for a couple different uh, consulting firms um, as a contractor for EPA doing a lot of uh, pretreatment compliance audits all across the country. I, th I think I've actually seen a few names on here that I recognize that I may have performed some audits at out in uh, EPA Region 9 when, when I was uh, traveling out there quite a bit. Um, but just once again, I appreciate you uh, letting me letting me speak. So <clears throat> I want to just kind of briefly chat real quick to get conversation going and then just kind of want to open it up and, and let anyone chime in, ask any questions that you have. Uh, or just make comments because I think that's kind of the intent of the roundtable is uh, just to hear everyone's perspective. So one thing real quick, I think that'd be really cool. We have approximately 100 participants, maybe a little more currently. Uh, of you that re that are actually pretreatment program staff, maybe just put in the chat box uh, approximately the number of craft breweries that you have within your municipality or within your sewer service area. I think it'd be pretty interesting to maybe see just the number of uh, maybe craft breweries, craft distilleries, uh, craft wineries uh, that, that we have. I, I'm just kind of curious of, of what the, t the ultimate tally is between approximately 100 people or so. Um, I, I saw someone, I think, uh, from HRSD earlier say that they had, uh, it was an astronomical number, um, maybe, uh, yeah, 64 or so. So just Throw that in there. We'll, we'll, I'll total it up at the end, and we will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the craft brewing industry, in my experience. So, I, as a former pre-treatment program manager uh, in Memphis, I think we have have somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, not as many as others, maybe 10 to 15 uh, craft breweries. But then we also have one relatively large, we would call a regional brewery, and um, they are a uh, like a not a name brand brewery. They're a contract brewer, 
they brewed uh, a lot of um, other people's brands. So they did a lot of like Mike's Hard Lemonade, a lot of uh, Sam Adams uh, are, are some of the ones that you may recognize. But the thing that's unique about some of these facilities is they don't always just brew beer. One of one of this facility's largest customers um, was Monster Energy Drink and Arizona Tea, which is funny, right? That Arizona Tea is also brewed in Tennessee, maybe not in Arizona all the time. So um, something that may be of interest to you there. But they discharged on average to our wastewater treatment plant in Memphis about a million gallons of wastewater each and every day. And they struggled meeting their, their pH limits because historically um, they, they never had any um, capabilities for neutralization. So I'm just going to throw up real quick a, um, a slide just so you can see uh, a few things here. So, <coughs> excuse me. So just real quick, just kind of glancing at, uh, and this is from the Craft Brewers Association, just glancing at kind of the numbers in, in Arizona, and this was from, from 2019, uh, but in, in 2019 uh, in Arizona, there were uh, approximately 127 craft brewers, breweries in, in, in the entire state. If you look at the trend from, uh, from about 2011 to 2019, uh, the, the number of craft breweries uh, uh, almost tripled. And so it's a pretty amazing uh, ha how they've grown just exponentially over the last, uh, let's say, 10 years. I inspected a, when I was working for EPA, I inspected a can facility, a can manufacturing facility out in California. And um, they, they said that the, the cans that they made for the brewing industry, 99% uh, of them went to uh, Anheuser-Busch and um, the Miller Coors Company um, five years prior. And they said, over the over a five year span, that that you know, let, at that time, less than one percent of their cans actually went to uh, the craft brewing industry, and that over the course of five years, that that number was up to like fifteen percent of the total number of cans that they manufactured went to the craft brewing industry just in five years, and that was that was probably four or five years ago. Um, I know that that's increased substantially even more since then. And I think one thing that's interesting to note is that you now see. The, the mega breweries, the Anheuser-Busch, the Miller Coors actually buying in, buying stakes of ownership into some of these um, smaller craft breweries. So this is a facility, and then I wanna just kind of open it up and talk to you a little bit, uh, or allow you to talk. This was a facility that I was doing some work with. Um, this was a brewery that had no pH neutralization. And so this was just their continuous um, hour by hour pH data with with no uh, pH neutralization. Um, and so you can see the wastewater that they discharged um, just every single hour was up and down, up and down. We started around 10, maybe a little bit over the next hour. We dropped down to, uh, you know, five or so, bounced back up to nine, down to, to, to four, four and a half, you know, just up and down all day long. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with these facilities, there, there's a couple reasons why their pH range range is so wide. Um, the beer itself is, is relatively acidic. Um, so if you've ever walked through a uh, brewing operation, uh, especially in the canning bottling line, there's, there's generally, you know, a, not a lot, but a decent amount of product loss um, in, that, in that particular operation. Um, and so there's always going to be some beer that gets spilled or spoils or cannot be used uh, that's going to ultimately make its way to the wastewater uh, system. Uh, then they also use, if you're not familiar with it, a clean in place or CIP process where they're going to use some uh, it's kind of a caustic cleaner generally. And then uh, they're going to come back with some type of an acidic, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and an acidic, um, what's the term I'm looking for, um, sanitizer uh, after a caustic cleaner. So you can see, you know, their, their pHs are going to be just all over the place. And so this particular um, municipality was actually struggling just downstream of this facility with um, the integrity of the collection system. It was a gravity sewer, uh, con reinforced concrete pipe, and uh, the, the bottom of the pipe had, had um, eroded. Uh, or corroded to the point that it actually collapsed and uh, they had to install an emergency bypass to uh, bypass pump around and um, repair the uh, the sewer line over the course of a few weeks and uh, was a was a pretty 
major expense to the to the to the municipality that ultimately they they then went back and took some enforcement action on uh, the the industrial facility. So just want to open that up now, maybe talk some to you uh, or allow you to talk. You know, ha- how many of you that have craft breweries or maybe even some large breweries? How many uh, of uh, how many of those? How many of you have some have seen issues within your collection system or maybe even at the wastewater treatment plant? Uh, related to high and low pH. Feel free to use the hand hand raise function. Feel free to um, use the chat box. Feel free to just interrupt me and just start talking. This is this is kind of casual, so um, you know, f- please feel free to to speak however you however you please. Hey Joshua, this is Jolene. I'm, I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona. And we have a we have a few microbreweries and meteries and then any of the distillery. And we're we're they're still pretty small, so they're not a lot of impact, but we do have one that keeps growing. And so when they expanded into their second location, we ended up um, having them put in a, uh, an equalization tank um, for their waste. And that seems to have helped because then they they can batch it in there and do their pH neutralization um, and then be able to uh, put it into the system and it not ha- and have a better pH with it. We also have the monitor for BOD and TSS and occasionally nitrogen uh, like a couple times a month just to make sure that they're they're doing well. We don't have them on a permit per se, but they've been very willing to work with us and, and it's funny because, because they're a microbrewery, they have nerds, <laughs> is what I found out, that they love to know what's going on with their their wastewater and stuff because they're so into the chemistry for their brewing process already that they they love delving in, into the science of what they're wasting also. But that's been a, a good experience for me to know that they're they're totally on board. And I don't, I don't know if I'll, any other breweries would be like that, but <laughs> just want to put that in. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. They so it is, especially like I've I've inspected I don't know probably a, at least thirty or forty breweries in my career, and it's interesting, especially in the craft brewing industry. They definitely are um, relatively not. They have some relatively knowledgeable and just inquisitive staff that are interested in kind of new new technologies, new trends. Um, Figuring out maybe unique ways that they can dispose of uh, of their byproducts. One common thing that I've seen, uh, and maybe this is a conversation for a little bit later, uh, but when you talk about some of the solids that they're going to generate, the trub, the waste yeast, things like that, um, a lot of times uh, farmers, cattle farmers, pig farmers, um, will come and take that and use that as a supplement. Um, for for animal feed, so um, I, I've seen that probably one of the most that that's probably one of the most common disposal uh, techniques because generally speaking, it's free to the brewery. Um, the farmers will come and get it for free because that keeps them from having to um, having to pay for um, mm-hmm. for disposal costs. Yeah, pretty much every brewery in our town does that on some level. Uh, some bigger than others. Uh, Travis, uh, so the EQ system is fairly simple at, at our that brewery. They just have uh, they have a, a a pump system because of all their drains. It, it pumps to just like a, a uh, I want to say they just got they upgraded to a bigger tank. I want to say like it's a three thousand gallon tank. Um, and it's got a cone at the bottom, so they usually have it on a stand, or um, so that way they can settle out sediment into it. Um, and so they don't discharge from there; they'll discharge higher up, so it'll be more of what uh, they don't get as much solids into the system, so their TSS is better that way. Does that does that help you, Travis? So one thing that's interesting, just kind of going back through the comments and just kind of quickly adding it up, I tried to make sure not double count some of the cities. Um, it looks like there are approximately 321 um, craft breweries or breweries in general, uh, maybe even some uh, some distilleries as well. 
uh, represented by just this small group of people, which is a pretty tremendous amount uh, when you when you think about it. Um, anyone else have any uh, questions about um, or, or comments related to, to pH or impacts that they've seen? Uh, maybe negative, maybe positive even um, related to pH specifically? Um, this is Amanda Albright with HRC. Um, I just kind of had a comment. Uh, so we have in Hampton Roads, Virginia, we have 64 total. That's wineries. We have a meadery. We have um, most of them are breweries. And then probably I think maybe six or seven of them are distilleries. Um, and going back to what the previous person had mentioned, using like an EQ tank, a, previously a lot of our our facilities were using their external CIP carts to waste mix and then discharge and that was becoming really encumbersome for them so they're starting to use kind of a similar EQ tank type thing where they have these large 55 gallon barrels of uh, from their from their chemicals that are empty so they'll use those to pump all of their waste into those to hold it and then batch dump so um, I don't think any of our microbreweries have room in their facility for a 3,000 gallon tank because they're pretty full. Um, but our, our alcohol beverage manufacturing BMP program started in 2016 when we had a similar issue with a, um, we had a similar issue with a brewery's pH discharge was so up and down that they ended up collapsing the line. And so that kind of got HRSD involved as the POTW. And so we do go out and inspect them annually. <clears throat> and they are required to pH neutralize before they discharge. So that's really interesting. One thing you mentioned that um, I, I would say, kind of generally speaking, I don't, I haven't seen in my career consistently is a beverage like kind of a semi-formal beverage BMP program. Are there any other municipalities here today that do have, you know, some type of a, a somewhat of a formalized BMP program specifically designed for the beverage industries that may, and I'm assuming that these are the facilities that don't necessarily meet the definition of an SIU, um, but, but need some type of additional oversight. Yeah, so we only have one brewery, or actually two, because we have Anheuser, but um, I think we have one other brewery that is permitted that does not that's not under a BMP because they do meet the the discharge requirements. But all the other microbreweries, they're way too small, but they cause they can cause a lot of issues. Yeah, for sure. Bre breweries are interesting, and I mean one thing that's kind of difficult and so this is this is probably a whole new presentation for another day but there's a there's also a like a political struggle there between pretreatment programs and you know let's say like the the community and um city council or your board because you know generally speaking i think that communities like the idea of of the craft brewing industry you know the the revenue and tax dollars and things that it brings in you know the the kind of the trendiness of you know the the kind of brew pub slash restaurant um and so you know that that there's some sometimes there's kind of a power struggle there right of how do you regulate these facilities but not over regulate these facilities to to run them out of town um but i mean at the same time you we as pretreatment program, you know, managers and staff, inspectors, our 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 sole responsibility is to 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 protect the infrastructure that's owned by the public, um, to ensure that the treatment plant operates effectively and efficiently. Um, and so, you know, just because a, a facility is new and trendy, it brings in lots of revenue, doesn't mean that they don't still get get regulated in some way. And so, I think that you know that BMP you know, beverage BMP specific programs may be kind of a good balance there to, to not not classifying them, you know, as an SIU, um, but but having some level of, of general oversight of the facilities. Any other comments or questions?
So I see, uh, Travis, it looks like you, you asked a question about just how do they pH neutralize? Is it a batch basis or active dosing systems? I don't know if you were speaking to somebody earlier or just in general. Uh, I've seen both. It just kind of depends on the size of the brewery. I've seen some breweries that, that batch treat, you know, uh, a couple thousand gallons at a time, maybe, um, maybe even as small as a few hundred gallons, depending on how small of a craft brewery that they actually are. I've also seen the larger facilities have, you know, an active flow, um, uh, flow through dosing system um, where, where they'll have some, uh, maybe a couple different um, treatment tanks, you know, a, 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 a rough, you know, kind of a rough neutralization tank and then kind of a polishing tank there at the end for, for final neutralization and then just actively discharging into the, um, into the sewer from there. So now let's maybe shift gears a little bit. pH is obviously a huge concern. Uh, I've seen a lot of a lot of collapsed pipes uh, due to due to corrosive pH, but they also um, can can have some other impacts. So this is let's talk maybe about their high organic loading, um, BOD, COD, TSS, uh, and just the sheer volume of wastewater that they generate in comparison to the amount of beer that they that they produce. And so this is just a uh, table. That was taken again from the Craft Brewers Association um, on a study that they did of, of about nine different breweries ranging in size, uh, and then they just kind of averaged the data. But you can see, you know, the BOD concentration on average from a craft brewery could be um, 10,500 milligrams per liter, and and a maximum of 16,000 milligrams per liter. And uh, you know, from a from a, a surcharge program perspective, that this would be one of your, although the volumes may be relatively low, the concentrations may be, you know, as some of the highest that you would even have in a, in a, in a surcharge program. Um, so it, does anyone have any comments or, or horror stories of um, impacts negatively that, that you've seen from an organic loading perspective or just a wastewater volume perspective? Yeah, this is Destin Ranch with City of Eugene, Oregon. Um, and I would just say, as far as like BOD and TSS goes, we have some larger breweries, we have small breweries uh, scattered throughout the city. Our plant is luckily large enough to where we actually uh, enjoy the the BOD concentration that it's sending us. It helps us, helps our plant out a, a bit. In fact, we're uh, talking about partnering up with the brewery to see if we can't direct inject some of their brewery waste into our, um, our uh, oh, uh, uh, digesters uh, just to help the process out better. Um, anyway, <clears throat> the problem that we run into is the breweries are getting charged a massive amount for, uh, um, for their wastewater. And it's because our ranges uh are so low that there's nothing they can do to their wastewater to uh actually clean it up enough to get below the high strength category or extreme high strength and so rather than them taking extra step steps to treat their wastewater any further they just let it go because uh they're gonna have to pay that amount anyway and so that's something i'm trying to push for in my city is like how can we reassess the strength charge to actually give industries an incentive to clean their water uh, more efficiently and and better but i'm running into into brick walls uh, mainly because it, it is a big re revenue stream yeah right <clears throat> well and, and so that's interesting too that in some scenarios it's actually beneficial to you because let's say you're sounds like maybe your your organic loading is low at some times and so this helps um maybe add some some organic loading or or maybe even some nutrient value um 
to, to the biological process, which is which is interesting because you don't hear you don't hear that side of the story all that often. I, I have seen a lot of um, a lot of brewery waste um, discharged directly into digesters, um, anaerobic digesters to, to capture, you know, the additional methane that they can that they can help produce. Um, so, I mean, that's definitely an alternative for a lot of municipalities who may have uh, anaerobic digestions, but that doesn't mean that it it doesn't always work flawlessly either. So um, just just note that um, it, it, it's not necessarily as easy as just, hey, let's just now, you know, flip a switch and put it all in the digester. It doesn't specifically work that way. So there's a little bit more science behind it. Um, there's some 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 loading rates that you have to take into consideration, but but that's another alternative and a good alternative because you know generally speaking, anaerobic digestion's essentially free, right? It it's uh, it it's uses none to limited energy um, from 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 a power supply perspective. So uh, that's a that's a good alternative. Any anyone else have any? comments or, or issues or um, maybe in your BMP programs for beverage facilities, do you surcharge them for high strength waste? And, and I'll throw out a, an interesting example. When I worked for Memphis, I mentioned that we had 10 or, 10 or 12, maybe 15. I can't remember the exact number of microbreweries. Um, and when you looked at their individual discharges, they were, um, you know, for, I mean, we were we had two major, you know, large uh, treatment facilities. Um, so their impacts were relatively minimal. But when when you looked at you know all ten or fifteen of their discharges from a daily base from a daily perspective combined, um, the amount of revenue that you're losing from those ten or fifteen facilities from a surcharge perspective, you know actually wound up being somewhat significant in the tens of thousands of dollars a year um, range, um, and, and so it was worthwhile, you know. For, for us to to look into the you know including including them on some type of a program just to just to capture surcharge fees um, yeah some Chelsea said they've seen some facilities greater than ten thousand milligrams per liter yeah and especially uh, that that trub waste uh, the the waste that's coming out of uh, that that super high strength waste, and it can be it can be extremely high concentration, VOD, COD. Travis asks if we routinely sample uh, to verify strength. So so you know that's kind of dependent on the size of the facility, the concentrations that you generally see. I mean. <sighs> One of the brewers we had in Memphis sampled every single day for flow, BOD, TSS, and they were surcharged on that. But they also discharged over a million gallons every single day of wastewater to the, to the collection system. So, um, you know, some of the other ones are on, um, you know, maybe like more like a monthly or quarterly uh, sampling program. If they want to sample more frequently, they're more than welcome to do that. And we can use that data uh, for, for surcharging. But uh, generally speaking, we would set kind of a minimum sampling frequency of maybe like monthly or quarterly, and then use that data to um, to assess surcharge fees. Hey, this is Keith from San Luis Obispo, California. I have a quick question. Um, so we have a few microbreweries and various breweries. Would you? What are your thoughts on like, I guess, sampling initially to get you know any new brewery in town as an idea where their strength is and then possibly I don't know determining whether they may seem like a continual sampling is a would be beneficial or maybe not well so so Keith, here's something that's really interesting about it is breweries especially craft breweries um, mm -hmm. in particular 
because like at Christmas time they make these like double bock high gravity <laughs> chocolate flavor, you know, like milk yeah. stouts, right? Like, yeah. So it's got like four thousand different grains and ingredients in it. Right. Okay. And, and it's gonna it's it's gonna have a different baseline let's call it bod concentration right um then then let's just say like your average um you know like bud light type um right type beverage. Okay. so mm -hmm. i mean i think generally speaking it probably helps to understand initially hey here's kind of what what we're seeing maybe you go out and set up a sample composite sampler for a week or so mm -hmm. and get and get four or five days worth of data um yeah just to kind of understand what they have and what they're discharging. Maybe you talk to them about uh, mm -hmm. seasonal beers, um, you know, different, different types of uh, uh, products that they may produce at different mm -hmm. times of the year to maybe, maybe decide, Hey, look, maybe we need to go out at, you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas time, you know, in preparation for these, or maybe like, I don't know, mm -hmm. like when they do like Oktoberfest style beers, you know, maybe they're a little higher as well, probably just because mm -hmm. they're, uh, the, the different grains that they use but uh, i mean i'm all for going out sampling as much as you can um, right yeah just so you, the the data is your friend in this scenario right, right. so um I'm, I'm all for you going out and doing as much sampling as you can justify just to understand to better understand what it is that they're discharging to your plant right um, you know, i think the, the for me the bigger issue just looking at it holistically is that you want the industries paying for the cost of their wastewater treatment. So I'm a right. huge, huge believer in surcharging any, any microbrewery, no matter mm -hmm. if they're discharging 500 gallons a day or 500,000 gallons per day. Right. Because if they're not paying for it. Then the average rate payer is ultimately eating the cost of that additional treatment. So, <laughs> so in, in an effort of being fair and equitable, to all of your users, whether they're domestic or non-domestic, mm -hmm. you, you should charge everyone based on what they what they send to the treatment facility. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I wrote that down as a note to bring up to our uh, our director as a possibility of considering. So I know there's some local communities that do surcharging for BOD and TSS and various constituents, and although we don't, and so yeah, I'll, and I'll definitely look into that. In San Luis Obispo, do you have any wineries by chance? We have at least one winery. And do they crush their own grapes? I I don't know. I just came into this program recently and um, plan on going out there sometime soon to check it out. So if so they do, I'm sh I'm sure it's going to be significant, you know. So that's an interesting question to maybe find out. I, I inspected the Gallo Brewery out in um, the Central Valley, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's the it's the largest winery in um, in in the United States. It, it mm -hmm. literally looks like um, a an oil refinery, just like wow. million gallon tanks of wine, yeah, and yeah. grape juice everywhere. But uh, the interesting thing about grape crushing is that it's seasonal. And so, right. and so they'll crush grapes like generally like one time a year mm -hmm. and then they save that uh, grape juice and use it to make, to make the wine year round. And so uh -huh. um, there's a huge amount of wastewater generated uh, and even solids generated from the uh, from the cr during the crushing season. Mm -hmm. It's not typically generated other times of the, um, of the right. year. So, that, so that's a question to ask when you do an inspection there. If they right. crush grapes, if so, if it's seasonal, just to have an understanding of if it could have detrimental impacts, or just to just to know mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. they're going to start crushing and when they're when they're done. Yeah, and one final question as far as you know, sampling new breweries. Um, yeah, and well, in fact, I just came into this program, and historically, no breweries have ever been sampled, which I find very odd. I'm like, all right, I'm going to get on that, going to start sampling them because we don't know what their effluent is or what's going into the um you know the potw but um as far as sampling do you always recommend going into the facility and setting up the composite at their effluent or is there ever instances in which you do like surveillance sampling at the uh 
Yeah, I guess at a downstream manhole. Um, so I mean, I think it depends on what your what's the intent of the sampling event. Right. Like, if you want to know 100%, it's that particular industry. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that you just about have to set it up at the um, right inside the facility, unless they're the only only uh, discharge source on that mm-hmm. segment of sewer. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, it's uh, it, if the intent is to is to maybe backtrack it through the collection system to identify mm-hmm. sources. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then maybe you're doing, you know, more surveillance style sampling, but I see. You know, okay. for, for me, you know, the source, right. You, know, you don't, uh, you don't know their concentrations and just kind of baseline mm-hmm. concentrations of, of BOD, TSS. Mm-hmm. Nutrients. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I would strongly recommend sampling directly at the source, not downstream. Yeah. The mantle. Yeah. That's what I was planning on. So just curious. Cool. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah, sure. Anything else on solids, BOD, nutrients? That That's one I think um, that, that this slide in particular doesn't necessarily cover, but nutrients is, is one where uh, it could be of issue if you have some stringent nutrient limits at your treatment facility. <clears throat> I have a question about true. Um, a lot of our breweries are finding it, I guess, hard to collect their trube in the process or trub. And I was wondering if anyone had any specific like screens that they know of or devices or any way that they've been able to see breweries um, collect that. So, I mean, I personally have seen um, like whirlpool style solid separation units, um, even at even at smaller craft breweries, to because I, I guess the troop's kind of difficult because it has the uh, you know, pretty small fine particulates within it, and and so um, it, maybe it's a little difficult from a separation perspective, but. Um, I, I think the whirlpools themselves, you know, essentially operate relatively effectively. I don't know if anyone else has seen anything different. <clears throat> uh, so. Travis, just kind of going back through the comments, Travis, you talk about uh, evaluating on pounds basis to account for their flow. Surcharges based on pounds of CD, <clears throat> TSS, NH4, we try to say follow Yeah, uh, so, so you know, I, I definitely recommend including all your, your breweries, distilleries into um, your, your high strength surcharge program. You, you are going to obviously have to go out there and do some sampling. Um, you're going to have to know, you know, relatively accurate flows as well, because you're right. Most surcharge programs are, are set up on a per pound basis. Um, you know, uh, of let's say COD in excess of, I'm just going to throw out a number, 700 milligrams per liter. Uh, so anything over 700 milligrams per liter, they, they, would, they would pay an additional treatment cost for treatment charge um amanda did you still have your hand up or did you have more comments to add i wasn't sure no sorry okay right, a quick comment that uh, i have josh um I'm, my name's richard uh from the city of tempe um we do with respect to travis's um comment on the billing um, we do a uh, a custom billing model like we have a per pound model and a concentration based model um, specific uh, for and that when I say custom billing, uh, if there's about five industries we have where we we require them to sample for COD and TSS 365 days a year and they submit us the data monthly and uh, yeah, and historically we had done it on a per pound basis, um, but then there was uh, one outfit that was getting penalized by volume, where they were um, they were discharging COD to the tune of about 640, which was 
about the median that uh, our wastewater plant was receiving in TSS around 200, yet they were getting lambasted for about $300,000 a month in sewer charges. And so we reevaluated that and uh, put them on a concentration base limit, which more more normalized it. Now, still considering the volume, they're still paying quite a bit. But um, and then we have a larger microbrewery that uh, what we do with all of our permitted industries is uh, we will we will conduct what we call internal billing sampling for them, and we'll develop a custom rate for that industry based on three years of loading data with a uh, data point minimum. And that works for industries that are under permit. So if we if we feel that there's a a strength impact by an individual industry, we'll look at uh, look at doing it that way. And then um, <clears throat> by default for our classes, yeah, we have four rate classes, and we're doing uh, we're we're doing a custom loading study um, just independently, where we're going to develop uh, we're going to um, <clears throat> more like kind of uh, cinch up our rate classes and have restaurants, bakeries, and we're going to throw breweries in there, have them separately, but we're going to develop our own rate scale, you know, based on uh, based on data that we collect over the next 18 months. Yeah, so I, Richard, actually, I think that's a great model. Uh, when I when I worked for Memphis, we had a very similar structure. Uh, industrial facilities were, were surcharged on loading uh, and concentration, but then breweries, uh, sorry, not breweries, bakeries, um, you know, restaurants, uh, food service establishments also received um, kind of a uniform increase, I guess, let's call it to their to their just general sewer service charge. So they received, you know, a, vo a volumetric fee, uh, but then also, you know, we would call it a, a surcharge or an additional treatment charge that that increased that um, somewhat to take into account that, you know, that the the, the the wastewater being discharged from bakeries, from food service establishment, generally speaking, is is higher in concentration than um, domestic wastewater. So uh, I, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, and for pH, uh, there was a lot of talk on pH. Um, what we do there, we have a criteria that uh, eventually, if uh, if the impact is enough, we'll we'll put them on continuous pH monitoring. And then, uh, you know, we have an escalating uh, fine model under our ERP that if untreated, it could get into five, six figures very, very, and has very, very quickly. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I commend you for that. I, so many programs need that, need that style of uh, enforcement capability. Um, I, I've always heard it say, say, I've always heard it said, that um, it has to be cheaper to be in compliance than to be out of compliance. Uh, otherwise, the industries are not going to, or the facilities are not going to comply if it's cheaper to be out of compliance for them. So they're much more financially driven uh, by nature. So so just be aware of that, that, you know, there there has to be financial incentives for them to be compliant with their permit limits. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. And we had one where that's exactly what was happening is it was just cheaper for them to pay surcharges than it was to um, address the problem. And it really wasn't, to, I mean, that was actually okay. I mean, it wasn't, uh, you know, it, like the, the, there was no impact that was like detrimental or imminent that was because of it. It only became a reality at uh, at the wastewater treatment plant. But, um, but yeah, then, you know, like anything, eventually, you know, that just has to stop. And, uh, and ultimately it did. And then uh, we had with our microbrewery, they created, or they were part of creating a capacity issue. But um, one of the users in that line were, you know, they wanted a capacity increase, and they got mo they had money coming out of the out of the wazoo, and so they invested like several million dollars and just rebuilt the sewer line, uh, the city line on their dime, just to, you know, cover their capacity needs. And uh, the other, some of the other users just benefited from it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. tra so Travis, you you mentioned continuous pH um, on their dime. So so I would say, generally speaking, that um, the and I've probably audited about a hundred pretreatment programs in my career. Um, if there's continuous pH monitoring at an industry, it's cover the cost of it generally is covered by the industrial facility. Um, I, I will say, and this is just a total side topic. But at Brown and Caldwell, we're, we're working with a lot of municipalities now 
who want that same capability in internal to their pre-treatment program, and we're helping them set up their own continuous monitoring stations. Um, for example, in Memphis, we have uh, t 10 of their largest industrial users. The city has their own pH monitoring equipment that they can access um, from, from anywhere at any time, whether it's a phone, a tablet, their computer, and can monitor the discharges from those 10 largest industrial users um, and, and, and see how they're, they're you know, how, how good how good they're doing at, at pH neutralization or or let's say lack thereof. Uh, and what's interesting is actually resulted in a substantial um, decrease in non-compliance from those ten industries because now the city has access to uh, you know real time uh, or near let's call it near real time. There's about a 15 minute delay, um, but near real time you know water quality data from those facilities. Um, really quick, Josh, on that, we make 100% of our industries do that, uh, put in that equipment and or do the 365-day um, year sampling on their dime. And uh, we further, we make them give us access to their equipment 24 hours, 24-7. Uh, we make them provide us passwords, um, the whole nine yards, so that uh, yeah, I could right now get into any of our industries that are continuous monitoring. And then we also put in out a compliance response protocol where um, – depending on the length and the magnitude of the incident, there's various steps they have to do up to and including if it's the middle of the night, they have to contact our SCADA, our, our SCADA control center. And if they don't, uh, they you know, we we have the uh, discretion to cite them for a permit condition violation. And under our model, that's 2,500 bucks a pop. Yeah, so I, Richard, I would say that that's amazing that you have that ability to, to access that data. I would say that you are definitely in the minority of most pre-treatment programs across the country. Um, I, I, I I've see it. I, I've, I've ran across it a time or two, um, but but it's it is not very common uh, that that pre-treatment programs have that capability. So, um, but but that, I commend you for that because that's amazing. No um, one's bought us on it. We've we've I've gotten zero pushback. Um, with anybody on that, that is just a, it is written into our permits as as language. And then when we get into them giving us passwords, it's generally that's generally as a result of of incident. And so we just slap it in as a permit condition. And um, but we very seldom get uh, get pushback on any of those kind of things. That's great. That's tremendous. So, Joshua, this is Jolene. I'd like to piggyback on a, a, to Richard's talk about uh, be nice to know how many municipalities that are on the line today do have a requirement for the continuous pH monitoring. And then if you do, um, how, uh, how did you come about to make that requirement? Yeah, I, I think that's great. Maybe just drop that in the chat. Um, and, and anyone that wants to just, you know, discuss that even more, feel free to, uh, to, to speak up. I, 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 and, you know, I, I think one thing that's interesting that we see a lot in real time pH um, recording is, is it, or let's call it continuous pH monitoring, is it chart recorders or is it paperless technologies where you can actually log in um, and, and see the data in, in real time or in near real time? Because um, even that itself has uh, some, some nuances and um, you know one would obviously be a little bit more preferred than the other. Um, in uh, in our case on that um, now it's all um, it's all um, electronic, but in the past we we made them do the old chart recorders, and uh, we make them submit that data, and they have to do it every two minutes. Uh, we make them submit that to us monthly, and they also have to submit a self certified um, environmental or as, excuse me, a, a self certifying violation log that identifies any uh, any violations because just because there's a outside of the limit doesn't always mean it's a violation. Sometimes it's an erroneous reading. Sometimes they're pulling the probe to calibrate, but we make them document that process every step of the way. So it has to be accounted for. Yeah, no, that's that's tremendous. Um, I, I can say that when I when I worked at Memphis, we we had probably we had about 100 SIUs and, and of those 100, we probably had at least 30 that were that were on continuous pH monitoring requirements. Uh, of those 30, 10 of them now have um, real-time pH equipment 
uh, installed, owned by the city. Um, hey, I see Rich Prencher uh, asked a question. I, and, hey, Rich, it, it's good to see you here. Um, do do I think that this is how pretreatment programs are going? And and do we, you know, do you think that we'll see more programs doing real time monitoring? Um, I do. It's uh, pH is probably the most prevalent because pH is uh, an approved uh, and it uses utilizes an EPA approved method, um, and it's generally pretty cheap as far as an entry point to get into real time monitoring. So you know, for about three thousand dollars or so per station, you can you can get into to real time pH monitoring. Um, there are there are a lot of other water quality parameters out there. Some some are, you know, EPA or standard standard methods approved. Some are not. Um, I personally think it's the future of uh, uh, of the pretreatment programs. We're we're probably a few years away from actually seeing, you know, let's say like COD or TSS or maybe even BOD as being approved methods for real time monitoring. But I think that. Uh, in the next in the next few years, we, we will we will see that become more of a reality. And, and as so as it does, I think you'll see pretreatment programs transition from kind of the 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 kind of legacy style, you know, ISCO samplers, 24 hour composites, pulling about every 15 minutes, or maybe they're flow proportional, to pulling you know every minute uh, a BOD concentration. Hey, Josh, there's a uh, technology that an Austrian uh, outfit and some people in this uh, in this forum probably heard of it, uh, S-Scan, where I've over the years have uh, like extensively uh, had a uh, had, like evaluated a unit and uh, it's basically just a, the 30 second cliff note version of it is, is it can sample for COD, TSS, nitrates through spectrophotometry uh, and where it stands on the spectrum. COD is a very easy parameter to monitor that way, and they take mon uh, readings every 90 seconds. Um, TSS is a very difficult uh, parameter to model that way because it's a, a heterogeneous matrix, and so it's hard for the spectrophotometry to account for the clumps and to really get a good good cross section of that. Because um, the technology works great in drinking water, but when you have a more corrupt stream, it's a little a little more difficult, but COD is such a homogeneous matrix that uh, it's it's shown to have very, very stable COD results in my experience with it. And uh, and I know other entities here on this call have, have uh, used that to varying degrees too, but uh, I was kind of one of those brewery type geeks that were mentioned earlier with the S-Scan. <laughs> like I really thought into it and wanted to, you know, figure out exactly how, how that could be effective. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's interesting. Do you let maybe we can shift the conversation to that a little more? Do you how did you apply it? Where did you actually do sampling um, with with their equipment at? And and I can tell you that I have quite a bit of hands on experience with S scan specifically. Um, and then as a company of, at Brown and Caldwell, we use a lot of other products such as uh, YSI, um, Proteus, a couple other uh um sensor vendors that that uh essentially do the exact same thing we did it at our we have uh because yeah, like tempe right now doesn't operate a wastewater treatment plant we're part of a a shrug partnership with uh, four other cities and actually five counting a minority partner but um we had one of our industries also that uh, does real time uh, they have to do daily cod and tss monitoring because that's how they're built and uh, they invested quite a bit in scan and um, yeah, we put the onus on them that if they can show us that it works, if they can demonstrate to us that uh, it could effectively monitor COD and TSS, we would consider allowing them to use that as their billing model as opposed and then aggregate daily charges on it as opposed to having to physically have two guys go out, sample it. And in the case of this place, they actually got because we require licensed uh, a licensed lab to do the analysis, so they actually went out and got an Arizona license for COD and TSS monitoring. And so they they have their own lab where they do the sampling and uh, they're subject to ADHS audit and everything else. But um, 
but uh, yeah, that industry, they, they still do it to this day, but they haven't quite, like they haven't been able to really consistently get it with, uh, certainly not with uh, TSS. Mm -hmm. So have you, have you surcharge built in, let's say for COD? Off of uh, the not not off of the S-scan yet, uh, because that's something that when we do it, we want to, because uh, Shrog was looking at that too. And uh, what we do now is part of the defense and strength behind our model is we we base it off of how how Shrog does it because that's our that's our plant, and so we kind of hold them to the same uh, same fire that we hold ourselves to. Um, but we're not opposed to it if we could really, you know, be be comfortable that it that it truly works like across the board, not for one parameter. I mean, it's like either build it that way or not. Are there any other, um, is there anyone else on the line that's used any of the real-time continuous water quality kind of smart sensor equipment that, that's out today? I can tell you that from my experience using it, we, I, I've used it a couple different applications. Uh, I, I've installed them at influent, effluent, or wastewater treatment plants. I've installed them in the collection system, generally at pump stations. Um, and then I've installed them at industrial, dist you know, permitted monitoring points. Um, and, and some have had better, better results than others. Um, I, I would say that there's a lot of benefit and maybe not the maybe the data is not 100% accurate, right? But I think that for the most part, if you look at the data from a trending perspective, the trend is 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 somewhat accurate. And knowing that that you know you, your brewery or um, you know dairy or you know whatever industry you have it installed at, you know that their that their BOD is just constantly up or their COD is you know really sporadic up and down all day long that 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 information in itself is useful whether it's 100 percent accurate or not so um the, it, it's a cool technology i think it's i think it's probably the way of the future um but you know i think until they're epa approved or standard methods approved there's going to be you know some reservation using those <clears throat> any other comments or questions on breweries or you know any other any other uh facilities you may have i'll show you a pretty interesting picture from a distillery that uh someone just sent me uh just a couple weeks ago share my screen again this is something i've never never thought of um So this is um, the effluent discharge in the ocean from a rum distillery down in uh, uh, the Caribbean area. And uh, I'm not gonna name the, the distillery just to keep them anonymous, but um, one issue that this particular distillery has is because the rum that they produce is, um, you know, a, a, a brown colored rum dark colored rum, it produces pretty high color uh, contrast in their uh, wastewater that's discharged to a municipal uh, uh, wastewater treatment facility that then discharges into the ocean. And uh, this is what it does to the uh, to the ocean periodically. So um, even outside of pH, outside of uh, organic loading, there's still some uh, even some other issues that that could uh could arise as well any other questions let me go back through the chat box real quick and see this I, and chelsea remind me we were supposed to go about an hour is that correct yep we just have a couple more minutes perfect so feel free raise your hand just interrupt me drop any questions or comments in the chat box i'm going to go back through see if i missed anything
so uh, um, what some person commented that they honestly wish they didn't have continuous monitoring because it's been a big headache. Um, I, I've experienced that to some degree from a, uh, you know, how do you handle content like 1440 pH data points every single minute, you know, every day, um, minute by minute data. How do you evaluate that for, for compliance purposes? Is there, you know, a minimum number that it's, you know, is one minute non-compliant considered a, a daily violation? How do you, how do you evaluate S and C? You know, there's, there's just a whole lot of questions um, that, that could be had revolving around continuous pH monitoring. And there definitely are some headaches that, that it can, it can create within uh, the operations of a pretreatment program. So I think that we probably answered all the questions. If I didn't answer your question, feel free to reach out to me uh, directly. I'd be glad to, uh, to chat with anyone that has any questions um, regarding pretreatment. I, I appreciate the round table. I think it's a great opportunity to maybe just kind of casually talk about um, issues that we all experience every day um, operating and managing our programs. And so um, I, I would say that, especially in a group this large, that there's a very high probability that whatever you're experiencing, someone else is, has has some experience with that. So um, I appreciate everyone's um, feedback and comments today. Nice job, Josh, for what it's worth. Um, yeah, excellent job uh, moderating this. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much um, for volunteering to be the moderator for today. You did a great job and um, I'm excited. This went really well today, so we have another half day plan for tomorrow from 8 a.m. to noon Mountain Standard Time. So just make sure you all show up again. Um, thanks everyone for all your input and participation. Um, we appreciate and I think everybody learned a lot um, with all the engagement that was going on. Um, thanks to our speakers, if some of them are still on. Um, Josh, can't wait for your uh, presentation tomorrow. And then we have Trisha presenting as well. So a lot of good topics and um, hope to see you all tomorrow. And uh, we'll take a quick second and shout out to Chelsea. I mean, she made this happen. I mean, this is a virtual workshop virtually on a dime and uh, she got 135 people in here together on a computer and it actually ran well. So. Uh, that I will say that Dave is a big task. part of that. If Dave's still on, he uh, Dave, um, too, yeah. <laughs> Dave um, and I with Glendale did a, a lot of work.